present, which is wonderful. And then uh, uh, I'm doing a little bit of housekeeping. That's why I'm pausing for a second. Uh, so, um, you know, I'm looking at uh, Lucinda, you're looking at, and I think Steve noted to me also, um, we want to remove the road districts uh, that we had scheduled for today and bring that at, back at another time. Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that opportunity to continue that item, Chair. Okay, that's 11 to 12 o'clock uh, on that. And we have people coming in at our 115. Is that correct or no? Um, and where I'm going with this is uh, uh, Patrice might have to step away for about 15 minutes during that afternoon one. Um, just pausing for a minute. Uh, we, you know, I, I think we have enough people that are looking at that, that we probably want to keep it in place at that time on that. Uh, but as we take a look at the agenda, so, is that right, Sue? Mr. Chairman, we don't have anybody coming from outside, but we are flexible if you need us to be. Mm -hmm. Steve, thoughts? Oh, I love the make. I got Mickey Mouse. Your audio is bad. You'll have to go out and come back in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's 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 only broadband, Steve. House. How long? Eighty nine. <laughs> Don't you live off eighty nine? There you go. Yeah. And Chair Ryan, I know that my 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 problem is, of course, I don't have a date or time. I have a date, I don't have a time certain, so probably be about ten minutes. And you know, another possibility is just take a a break. And I apologize, to everybody, for having to give you a break. Um, but um, uh, there's this is the only time that um, uh, I can appear for this um, meeting. So I appreciate that. And and it will be between one and two, and it should be not last longer than 10 minutes. Yeah, let's see how our topic's going, Patrice, on whether we break. Uh, it might you. be good, you know, it's a hot topic. Uh, it might be good keeping it right where it is. Um, sure. You know, hot meaning, very important topic. Uh, I think it's a very important yeah. topic. So if we could so, just take a quick break, maybe that would be great. So yeah, and, and, and we'll see, uh, you, you know, on the break then. We'll see how it's rolling along. Okay, okay. Um, and let, okay, I'm just giving a little bit Back. more. Okay. We have Supervisor Fowler, uh, Vice Chair, uh, logging in at this point. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. No, I'm, I'm just letting you know I'm back. I'm back. Yep. Okay, we got Steve back. We got so, Supervisor Fowler coming in. Okay, we're a little bit, uh, a little bit of pause. Sometimes you need to make sure we have the order we want for the agenda if we're going to modify. Okay, next item on business is I've, I've called the meeting to order and we have the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everybody could please rise and uh, join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, if you don't have a flag, face the peace. Uh, and I pledge allegiance to the flag and to the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That is, uh, what do they call it? I have to go back to my choral friends, my son and all. Uh, we were out of harmony though, I would have to say on that one. But well done. Uh, let's see, next item of business is called public. This is a courtesy we offer the general public. Uh, 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 to, uh, if you'd like to bring something to our attention that is not on our agenda. And so I'll pause just for a second. And Lindsay, if you could tell people how they would uh, uh, use the public uh, comment period. Sure, thank you, Chair Ryan. If you would like to speak during the comment period, you're just gonna click on the raise, eye, raise hand icon that looks like a hand at the bottom of your screen. And then that will um, notify us that you wanna speak and we will allow you to speak. All right. And do we have anybody? I'm not seeing anybody. How about you, Lindsay? At this time, we do not. Okay. So we'll go ahead and close that public comment period uh, and proceed uh, on to 
a proclamation that we have. And today uh, we have a proclamation. It's consideration of possible action to approve a proclamation recognizing the service of the Arizona National Guard staff, Sergeant Brandon uh, Ballesteros, uh, to the Coconino County during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have uh, Tim Carter uh, presenting uh, on this item. And there is Tim. Chair. Good morning, Chair Ryan, members of the board. Uh, thanks for letting us join you for a few minutes this morning. Um, before we read the proclamation, I'd like to provide a, a few brief comments. Um, so as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic created the need for additional staffing uh, all across the state. And this was true in Coconino County as well. Uh, in response to this need, uh, National Guard troops were activated uh, and made available for deployment to, to the counties. So back in late March of 2020, Coconino County requested four soldiers. Uh, and a week later, they arrived to assist us at the Health Emergency Operations Center in the logistics section. Uh, one of these soldiers was Staff Sergeant Brandon Ballesteros. Um, to date, uh, we've had dozens of airmen uh, and soldiers have rotated through Coconino County doing various missions at the food bank, uh, a lot of our testing events, vaccine events, things like that. Uh, but Staff Sergeant Ballesteros has been the one soldier that has remained with us the entire time. Um, he, he quickly earned the trust of Director Deason and myself. Um, his leadership has proven invaluable to the county's response to COVID-19. Um, while he, I, I will pause for a minute and say while he earned our trust, he may be questioning that at the moment. Um, it, we, we didn't really tell him why he was joining the meeting today. Um, he thought he was coming to answer some questions from the board. Um, quite frankly, we were a little afraid that his humility would uh, want to prevent him from wanting to attend um, and, and meet with us today. So um, Brandon was able to travel all across Coconino County with our, our teams uh, to assist with vaccine testing events, um, as well as served as one of the primary points of contact for the daily operations of the county's non-congregate sheltering operations last year. Um, also, as wildfire season began to kick off this year, um, Brandon assumed charge of all logistical operations for COVID-19 response, uh, which really allowed for the emergency management staff to, to focus on those wildfires. So um, we, we really do appreciate that. He, he's done a tremendous amount of work uh, for us. Um, he's been with us for the last 16 months, uh, which um, knowing that he is a, a husband and father to several small children um, is it, it, really made and an even more profound impact um, for him being able to, to de dedicate his time to this. So uh, before I read the proclamation, I, I did want to turn it over to Director Deason for any comments he may have. Yes, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Board members. I'll be very brief. Um, I, Tim's really covered it very well, and the proclamation will, will be very specific, and thank you to the Board for this consideration. Um, I, I will just say as a personal thanks to, to Brandon, um, what Tim said was right. You know, when Brandon showed up, I, he probably came in here not really knowing, having any idea what he what to expect, which is probably appropriate because we didn't know what to expect at that point in time. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, Brandon never said no to anything. Uh, he shoveled snow. He ran a COVID hotel. He handled PPE. Uh, he did literally anything that we we needed in support of the COVID response and. Uh, he answered his phone every time. He gave up time with his families, with his family on the weekends. He, he really, really threw himself into this effort. So we appreciate you taking the time to acknowledge uh, or consider acknowledging him and his efforts and his contributions. So Brandon, just a personal thanks from me. Thank you for all you did, sir. Back to you, Tim. Thanks, Wes. I so, Mr. Chair, I, uh, as a result of his tireless efforts, I'd like to read this proclamation for the board's consideration. Um, and it is a Coquina County proclamation in recognizing the service of Staff Sergeant Brandon Ballesteros. That whereas, whereas on March 18, 2020, Coquina County Board of Supervisors declared a local emergency pursuant to ARS 26-311 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And in response, uh, whereas Cooking County Emergency Management requested additional personnel resources from the Arizona National Guard to support the Cooking County COVID-19 Incident Management Team, 
And whereas Staff Sergeant Ballesteros reported to Coconino County on April 2nd, 2020, to support the operations of the logistics section through the procurement, allocation, distribution, and tracking of millions of pieces of personal protective equipment, managing the non-congregate sheltering hotel facility, testing and vaccination efforts throughout the county, and staffing support in the Health Emergency Operations Center and the Emergency Operations Center. And whereas during times of emergency and disaster beyond COVID-19 response, Staff Sergeant Ballesteros took charge of all logistics section operations to allow Coconino County Emergency Management staff to respond appropriately. And whereas he has provided leadership by training additional soldiers and airmen that have rotated through the Coconino County COVID-19 response, and whereas in his 16 months of service to the citizens of Coconino County, Staff Sergeant Ballesteros has distinguished himself as a reliable and respected leader and an effective non-commissioned officer in the Arizona Army National Guard. And now, therefore, the Coconino County Board of Supervisors proudly recognizes the contributions, leadership, and service of Staff Sergeant Brandon Ballesteros to Coconino County and wishes to express our profound gratitude for his support through the unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic response. Further, the Coconino County Board of Supervisors and citizens of Coconino County wish Staff Sergeant Ballesteros well in his future endeavors. <laughs> Signed and sealed this 24th day of August, 2021. I would like to go with the motion to approve the proclamation. I so move that we, that we approve the uh, proclamation uh, honoring uh, uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Ballesteros. I'll second that motion. Second by uh, Supervisor uh, Vasquez. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 And uh, uh, actually, uh, you know, an opportunity for the board to comment. I, I would like to uh, bring up the staff sergeant as well. Staff sergeant, could you come on screen by chance? I see you're off mute. Don't know if you have a video capability. Are you there, sir? He, he did mention earlier that he may have uh, video issues. Okay. Um, may All have right. voice only. Okay. Well, actually, you know, I'll just start out from the board perspective. Um, uh, pandemic is just uh, extraordinary impact to community uh, nationally, uh, you know, at the state level and, and most certainly at the local level. Uh, and and where, uh, you know, the bits, uh, the boots hit the pavement, so to speak. Uh, uh, it, these are key individuals uh, and staff sergeants, uh, as noted, exemplary um, uh, service uh, on behalf of our county, uh, absolutely wonderful. Uh, we appreciate, uh, you know, it's not just you, all those behind you, but you orchestrating and working on behalf of our community. Uh, and Tim and Wes, really appreciate uh, you bringing forward this proclamation on behalf of the staff sergeant. Uh, turn to other board members if we have comments. Uh, Supervisor Horstman. Yes, thank you. And, and uh, you know, uh, Tim Carter and Wes Dyson, you know, we certainly appreciate you bringing this forward because we know and many of us saw firsthand and certainly our whole community uh, saw the service that was really done by the Arizona National Guard when they stepped up and helped our community on this COVID-19 outreach. Uh, and uh, just uh, it was just crucial to us being able to serve our community. And uh, um, Staff Sergeant, we appreciate all of your efforts here in Coconino County. Um, I, I wish we'd give you the key to Coconino County, but I don't think we have a key to Coconino <laughs> County. So it's great that we have this uh, resolution. And again, thank you so much for your service. Um, uh, all of us here at the board, but certainly our whole community really appreciates uh, your efforts and the efforts of your colleagues. So thank you very much. All right. Any further comments? Yeah, I'd just like to say thank you. Had an opportunity to meet you in touring and, and going through the EOC a couple of times. And I really appreciate your investment in the community and be, you being an integral part of the, the EMS, EMS team or emergency response team and, and part of Wes and Tim's team. And so I appreciate all the work that all of you have collectively done. Thank you not just through COVID, but also through the fires and the flood mitigation. And I know, uh, Staff Sergeant, I, I saw you during those efforts as well. So I appreciate all the all that commitment to our community. 
and this proclamation is well deserved. So thank you, team, for bringing it up. All right. Anything further? Yes. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Let's. Uh, I'll go to you in a minute, uh, Lena. If, uh, we have. To, uh, we do have staff, Sergeant. Please. All right. So uh, first off, uh, thank you to uh, the board and uh, Wes and Tim for giving me the opportunity. Um, though it sounds like a lot, uh, honestly, it was just uh, just me being able to serve the community, you know. And uh, even if you, I, I we made a joke. I was like Wes and Tim. If you wanted me to cut your grass, I'll go cut your grass, sir. You know, that's that's how much I'm invested into this. So uh, again, I appreciate uh, all the. Uh, the uh, accolades there and um you know it's it sounds like a lot but honestly i, I think we all play a, a integral part of just getting over this uh, pandemic so again thank you guys uh each and every one of you and um uh i'm gonna shoot my shot here if you guys are looking to hire somebody i'm open to coming back up to coconina county and the flagstaff area so uh again thank you everyone um i appreciate it and uh hope to see you guys in the future all right, uh, wonderful. Uh, we have Vice Chair uh, Fallon. Go ahead, Nina. Hope you're on mute. There you are. Yes, thank you. Um, I am so happy. Not hearing you. Hello? No? No. Why don't you try and fix that, Lena? I'll go to the Supervisor Baguette. Go ahead, Judy. Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Staff Sergeant, I'm so proud of you and others that have really, really stepped up, you know, to help with the COVID activities that were, were there for our, for our, to serve the people. And also that, you know, it, it takes a lot to, to be a public servant. And knowing that I've been a public servant for 40 plus years, almost 50 years, you know, I, it, it, it gives me gratitude and it gives me um, um, a lot of um, good feelings about myself, you know, and I'm pretty sure, you know, um, we feel for people out there and that's when you help people, you know, you feel good about it. So I just want to say I thank you to everyone that has, you know, stepped forward, you know, uh, taking care of the COVID and um, addressing it and and being um, proactive, you know, in, in, in what was encountered. So I just want to say thank you to everyone and um, all the leadership within the Camino County that made this happen and um, on the city side too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, this time I'm muted. Go ahead, Lena. No, you're, we're not hearing you. Yeah. Can you go ahead and try and turn off and turn back on? Okay. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, very appreciate that uh, willingness to come up and work for us, uh, Staff Sergeant. I'm sure we'll have something out there. So uh, uh, keep looking and uh, yeah, you have other eyes to help you out there. Uh, uh, really appreciate it. Um, okay, uh, Supervisor Fowler is gonna try and fix her voice on that. And we'll bring her back for a, a comment. Um, next item, you know, I, I do want to, we do have a little bit of a gap uh, that was created this morning because of removing that last item for this morning. Uh, we are running a little over, but uh, well worth it. And I'm not seeing Supervisor Fowler swing back. So what, let me pause for a minute. Lindsay, you're not seeing her popping. Also, Brandon, uh, uh, or uh, Staff Sergeant, uh, we have comments coming in. Um, the uh, uh, Kim Musselman, uh, thank you, Brandon. Your work supporting the pandemic and response has been amazing. You will be missed. And it was an honor to serve with everyone there, uh, your response. So really appreciate it. How are we doing, Lindsay? Is, do we have a share back? Um, we do not. Okay, I'm going to, I need to move us on uh, at this point. Uh, I'll go ahead and move us into the consent agenda. Uh, and consent agenda is routine in nature. Uh, often uh, we will have seen these items in work session. 
were uh, it may be a renewal of a contract. And so we, we wrap them into a single vote unless the board would like to separate uh, any items. Uh, and so I'll pause for a moment to see if the board members would like to separate items and Supervisor Horston. Yes, thank you, Chair. And I would like to, to uh, um, remove item eight from the consent agenda. Um, I do believe we have a uh, uh, town, Tuzian town manager, uh, Charlie Hendricks is with us and uh, I would like to remove this so we, she could uh, address us on this issue. Awesome, that'd be neat. Okay, other board members, any separation? Not seeing any, I'm just pausing for a minute to try and look at my screen and scroll to see if Lena's popped in. We haven't got her yet. Okay. Okay, so um, let's go ahead and uh, uh, I uh, consider a motion associated with the uh, uh, consent agenda, and that is comprised of items uh, 2 through 32. And Supervisor Horseman is separating out item 8 for separate consideration. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, please. I would take uh, make a motion at this time to approve the consent agenda items 2 through 32. Uh, removing item eight for later discussion. All right. I second the motion. Motion by Supervisor Horseman, second by Supervisor Begay. Uh, any discussion? Hearing no discussion, I'll call for the question. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Motion carries. And that is a 4 0 vote at this point. Okay. Um, so separation of item number eight, Supervisor Horston. Yes, uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And uh, we have item eight uh, is uh, from Coconino County Community Development. Um, and I do believe Jay Chrysleman is on remotely if we uh, would like to hear from him. And I know that uh, Tuzian Town Manager uh, is with us. And I don't, I've, I have only talked to her on the forum. We have not met each other personally yet. Hopefully that'll happen soon. And I don't think other members of the board have had an opportunity to meet uh, Charlie Hendricks. So that would be wonderful to give her an opportunity uh, to address this issue. Uh, it is basically a uh, agreement uh, between, intergovernmental agreement between Coconino County and the town of Tuzian, wherein Coconino County is to provide technical assistance in the areas of building inspection and permit review. Uh, the uh, Coconino County had provided these services in the past uh, years, and uh, the um, Tuzian is requesting that uh, we, uh, in the future going forward, also continue to pro provide these services for the town of Tuzian, which I am very much in agreement for uh, this intergovernmental agreement. And, and at this time, it may be a good opportunity to uh, turn this over to Charlie Hendricks. Okay, and I'm looking, do we have her promoted there, Lindsay? Yes, we do, Chair Ryan. Okay. I'm just struggling reading names, I guess. Ms. Hendricks, you um you are unmuted and you can turn your camera if you'd like. Well, I don't want to I don't want to break your camera, so if you're okay, I'll just stay an audio participant if you don't mind. Um, and and if you're okay, I'll let Jay um, speak to the specifics of the agreement because he's a a much better speaker than I am. But Mr. Chair and and Madam Horseman, um, thank you so much for having us here today. I just want to thank you all for, um, for the work of your staff on this issue, not only this issue, but several other issues that we've had going on with the county. You've been incredibly gracious to us, and we are so grateful for all the efforts you've made with us. Um, I'll let Jay go through the agreement, but we just want you to know that we're highly in favor of this agreement at this time. All right, Jay. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Supervisor Horseman. And Charlie, thank you so much for being on. I'm actually down at Phoenix at a conference, but happy to be on this agenda item. Uh, it's something we've been working on for many months. Uh, very happy to be working with you guys again in Tucson. Uh, we've been very impressed with your team. 
Um, just so everyone's aware, there is not a tremendous permit activity. Uh, there was five or six, I believe, last year that we would have handled. So it's something that the department is capable of, of doing. Um, we're near the region in the Valley area and north of there twice a week anyways. So we're happy to be able to assist and uh, looking forward to continuing uh, the partnership. Thank you, Charlie. All right, bring it back to Supervisor Horseman. And just to say, welcome on board, uh, Charlie. Uh, we look forward to uh, working with you all tonight. And I know Supervisor Horseman will more so uh, with Tucson in her district, but uh, welcome. Go ahead. Yes, absolutely. We hope one of these days we'll get back to a normal more normal uh, meeting schedule and, and certainly uh, you and the mayor are invited to uh, our board meetings coming up uh, hopefully in person here in the not too distant future so thanks for being with us uh, via our zoom meeting this morning uh, Charlie um, at this point uh, Mr. Chair I would like to move um, that we approve intergovernmental agreement with the town of Tuzian to perform building division plan review and inspection services all right, I have a motion by Supervisor Horseman. I need a second. I second the motion. I have a second by Supervisor Begay. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Okay, aye. and it looks like we have Supervisor Vice Chair Feller back. Uh, nope, I can't hear you. Your voice isn't working. Nod your head on your vote. Yes, aye. Okay. There we go. So we have a 5 0. We did go through the consent agenda, Lena, while you were working on it, but we don't have voice. Uh, uh, so if you, you know, you might use uh, uh, text with uh, Lindsay, uh, you know, giving us a heads up if you want something uh, held up and, uh, until you can get that text. Okay. Okay. Uh, so next item. Uh, we've worked our way all the way through item 32 with uh, the approval of that. Uh, so next item, we need to resolve as the flood district board of directors. I need a motion, need a motion to do so. I, I move we resolve as a flood control district board of directors. I have, a, I have a motion by Supervisor Horseman, a second by Supervisor Begay. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 And we're now acting in the capacity of the flood control uh, district board of directors. We have a consent agenda before us and there are items 33 uh, through 42. Uh, and many of these are, are renewals uh, of, uh, and or uh, uh, RFQs that we've had. Uh, but um, I wanna see if uh, board members uh, I wanna separate any and it looks like uh, uh, Lucinda's uh, uh, popping up as our flight control district board of director, uh, uh, well, not board of director, but uh, administrator. And Lucinda, did you want to comment on this just uh, with all the items that we do have? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We got it, Jelena. All right. Thank you to Matt Fowler. The all right. Fowler's teamwork. <laughs> all right. So, Lucinda? Certainly, um, as you noted, Chair, these are renewals um, every, I believe it's every uh, five years or uh, we go through a process where based on qualifications, we select the engineering firms that we work with um, and that have just frankly been, have been instrumental in our response to museum and our other flood events and um, so these are very important contracts that we fully utilize uh, and are certainly doing so right now. Um, so thank you for your consideration. All right. All right, thank you, Lucinda. Okay, uh, and I'm not seeing anybody wanting to separate. So we have a consent agenda here for the flight control district items 33 through 42. Uh, Supervised, um, go ahead, Chair, I'd like to make a comment. I think the flood district is very important. It's very important on what we're working on and it is uh, understandable that it is an emergency that we're in. However, we need to make sure that we are still working um, across the county. Fl flood district is for the whole county and we wanna make sure that we are remembering um, the rest of the county. I know that when during an emergency, um, we have to really 
focus all our staff into the emergency situation here. But at the same time, we have to make sure that we stay focused throughout the whole county. And I know you're all doing that, Lucinda, and your team. Just want to thank all of them. However, I just feel like I really, I need to just bring that up. Thank you. This, this and, is a, is this the first time you're bringing that up? <laughs> I could give you a trouble on that. And, and yeah. we, we haven't had our meetings with the towns and continued those meetings, you know, uh, regarding the change in the flood district. We still have not worked through that. At some point, you know, we're going to need to start moving in that direction again. So I just, I, I, we have an emergency. I totally understand that, but we need to remember that we, we have to, we have a full work to do throughout the whole county. So just want to thank you, Lucinda and our county manager. I know you're all aware of that, but I feel like just need to bring it up. Thank you. Mr. Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Um, to follow up on Supervisor Fowler's comments, I will get with staff and identify the, the I guess, some of the work to be done that's not been done yet. I'm gathering that. So I'll get with staff and we'll connect back to to the, to the board on next steps regarding the flood control district discussions. Thank you. I have a comment, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got a couple people going uh, on this. Uh, one thing is I, I do want to narrow it a little bit. Uh, this is work that we can do. Uh, we do want to stick to, uh, we have contracts before us on uh, flood control uh, district at this point. Uh, go ahead, Supervisor Begay. Um, good morning, um, my colleagues and people that are in attendance, but um, what I want to do is um, reiterate what um, Ms. Fowler has said, and um, only because, you know, we're, we are in a district and the flood district should include, and um, possibly if it's not, then, you know, it's got to be extended out, you know, to help other people uh, within the whole overall county, and um, as you know, um, we, we uh, on the northern part of our district, we had um, a, a big issue on the floods that came through, took out some uh, bridges and stuff like that. And, you know, things like that. So I'm working uh, with the council delegate and um, also um, the president's office at this time sure. to see what can be done. But um, I just want to say thank you, Lucinda, your staff, you know, for getting out there with uh, four graders from, um, from your from our Coconino County to do a lot of stuff in our uh, uh, in our flooding area, but I think you know uh, we need to uh, offer other areas you know the flood flood district uh, district plans or whatever there may be. Thank you. So you know, in these contracts that we have, they they do go across the district. Uh, I can make a note of that. Uh, however, uh, what we do and what we're doing with the flood control district. Uh, those are conversations that Steve can bring back to us, as he had noted. Um, I believe, uh, 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 Rose, did you want to follow up on this? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, hang I'm on just, a second, Go ahead. I'm just wearing, we've got a consent agenda in front of us with very specific contracts yep. that are up for approval, and that's all we've got on the agenda. Yep. Um, you know, it sounds like some of this might be better for the roundtable discussion, mm -hmm. um, it, you know, in terms of district specific updates, you know, unless I, I don't believe there's another flood control district item on the agenda, but um, but I, 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 you know, that's my concern is I want to make mm -hmm. sure we're not uh, stepping away from, you know, what what the agenda actually uh, allows the board to discuss right now. I have a comment. Okay. Uh, I, I want to make a comment. Let me, um, let me let me go with uh, Supervisor Horseman and then I'll come back to you, Supervisor Begay. Supervisor Horseman. Yeah, I was actually ready to make the motion uh, right. since this is, is a, con a consent agenda item and is not set for discussion. Uh, so I was going to make a motion to accept the consent agenda for the flood control district. I will uh, second that motion. Motion by uh, uh, Director Horseman, second by uh, uh, Vice Chair Fowler. And then your comment, if you can keep it into the contract uh, discussion, Supervisor Begay. I think that um, we should be discussing other things and so that people know, the staff know what we're talking about and what our thoughts are, not to say only to the agenda. I, I think that if we're going to have comments to be made, I think it should be made. And I, I, just, I just want to say uh, that portion again. Thank you. 
So we all have opportunities to bring these back and we can bring them, you know, Steve had noted, we can bring other items back, but not for today. We have this consent agenda uh, here. I have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 And any opposed, not opposed, motion carries unanimously. Next item of business is um, we need to resolve as the Board of Supervisors. So moved. Second. Motion by Director Horseman, second by Vice Chair Fowler. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Okay, next we need to resolve as the Health District Board of Directors. So moved. A, second. a motion by Vice Chair Fowler, second by uh, Supervisor Vasquez. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Now we have a consent agenda, only the consent agenda item here in our health district. Uh, and so, uh, uh, barring separation, um, uh, I consider a motion uh, on this consent agenda. Anybody care to move it? So moved. A uh, motion by Director Horseman. Need a second. Second. Second by uh, Director Begay. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Uh, next, aye. we need to resolve is the Board of Supervisors. So moved. Motion second. by, uh, what are we now, directors? Uh, by Director Horseman, second by Vice Chair, was that Vice Chair Fowler on the second there? Yes. Yes. Okay. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Okay, next we need to resolve is the Board of Equalization. So move. And a second. Motion by Vice Chair Fowler, second by uh, Supervisor Horseman. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 And now we have Board of Equalization here. Are we good, Supervisor Horseman, on Board of Equalization? Just pause for a second. I'm just looking to see on this okay. one, but I do not think I was involved in this at all. No, I was not, so I'm fine. No, okay. Okay, I meant to ask you earlier this morning, and I missed that. I, it so. didn't look familiar. Okay. And Lindsay confirmed. All right. And, and just for the sake of record, uh, since we're in public uh, meeting, uh, uh, Supervisor Horseman used to be a hearing officer, but she has no conflict of interest associated with this, uh, is what we're checking on. And I, well, was, actually wasn't the hearing officer. I actually was the attorney. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Thank you I, have for that. Been, I have not been involved in this one. We already right. forget. <laughs> That's right. How quickly they forget, Lena. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, with this, this is a consent item. Uh, and barring separation, I'm not seeing anybody wishing to separate this item. Um, I consider a motion for approval. So and look that we oh. approve the Board of Equalization Resolution 2021-20-01, uh, receiving and accepting the hearing officer's decision for petition for review of property valuation on tax year 2002-2022, not numbers, hearings conducted July 20th, 2021. Okay, I have a motion by Director uh, and Vice Chair Fowler. I need a second. Second. Second by Director Begay. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Not opposed. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, next uh, item is we need to resolve as the, uh, uh, let me just uh, double check, as the Board of Supervisors. So move. Motion okay. by Vice Chair Fowler, second by, who was that second? Second. Judy. Judy, okay. Um, uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. Okay, uh, we're now acting as the Board of Supervisors. We're now up to item number 45. And item 45 is a liquor uh, license uh, in the, uh, for the Kaibab Lodge uh, with the zip uh, associated with Fredonia, Arizona. 
And we have our clerk of the Board of Supervisors, Lindsay Daly, that'll present on this item. Thank you, Chair Ryan. Um, we did receive a liquor license application from the state and this is for Kaiba Lodge, which is located in District 5 at the 26 mile south junction highway 67 and 89A. And this is for a series seven beer and wine bar and it's an owner transfer. So there's already a liquor license that exists at this location. And it's got a new owner at the, at the Kaiba Lodge. And the applicant's name is Lawrence Franklin Ennis Jr. And we went ahead and had the did for 20 days. We've not received any comments regarding the application. We also sent the application for review from our sheriff's office, risk manager, community development, and health department. They don't have any concerns regarding the application. And the board is required to consider and make a recommendation on the application. The recommendation may be to approve, disapprove, or offer no recommendation to the state. Again, the, the board does not issue the license, but makes its recommendation based on knowledge of the local area and the needs and desires of the community. And just so you know, Mr. Ennis um, was not able to be here today for the hearing, um, but again, we haven't received any comments or concerns regarding the application. I'd like to make the motion. Uh, actually, we have to go through a oh, well, hearing. Okay. hearing. Yeah, hearing first associated with it. Uh, but first, let's, uh, and, and actually, what I'll do, uh, Supervisor Begay, it is in District 5, just as a courtesy, offer the opportunity yeah. for okay. the vice chair on that. Um, but uh, before we do, any questions of the board? No, I'm not seeing any. So I'll go ahead and uh, open it up to public hearing. Lindsay, explain the process for public hearing. Sure, if you would like to make a comment regarding this item for the public hearing, press on the raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen so that we can see that you speak, and then we will speak. And I am not seeing anybody wishing to speak. How about you, Lindsay? No, I don't. Oh, okay, I'll go ahead and close the public uh, hearing and bring it back to the board. And I'll turn to uh, Vice Chair Fowler. Yes, thank you. Um, the Kaibab Lodge, it is under new ownership. We were just up there last week through uh, driving through there. Uh, and I would recommend that the board approve this liquor license for this um, um, establishment. Um, at Kaibab uh, Lodge. Okay, I have a motion by, uh, and so your recommendation to the, uh, it's a recommendation of approval, is that correct? It is. Okay, uh, I have a recommendation, a motion with that recommendation, I need a second. A second. I have a second by Supervisor Vasquez. Uh, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Any opposed, not opposed, motion carries unanimously. And good luck to the new owners, wonderful. Absolutely. Okay, uh, next item of business um, is, and we're just about back on time. Uh, and we have time after this as well that we can look at things. Uh, and this is uh, consideration and possible action, approval of the resolution 2021-38 amending and reapproving tax rate for fiscal year 2021-22, tax year 2020-21, for all special taxing jurisdictions for which Coconino County has the authority to collect taxes, approve uh, the new resolution of tax pursuant to ARS 38431.03A3, the board may go into executive session on this. And this is presented uh, by our treasurer, so we do have our treasurer here, and there's Sarah Benatar. Uh, all right, so Sarah. Good morning, um, Chairman Ryan and members of the board. Um, we're bringing this to you to make an amendment um, specifically to two uh, tax rates. The first um, involves Flagstaff Unified School District, um, and that is in response to a Court of Appeals decision that was issued 
um, actually on the same day that we uh, adopted the rates. So there was no way to avoid that one. Um, and the second one has to do with City of Flagstaff, um, just a correction on a tax rate that was adopted there. Um, and any further questions, I would be happy to discuss um, since this does involve a legal matter. That is why we did reserve the time to be able to go into exact session to discuss further. All right. Uh, and we're pausing for a minute uh, associated with this. Uh, I'm not hearing a, am I getting a recommendation to go into executive session? This You're, you're just saying that if, if the board wished to. Uh, right, Sarah? Yes, right. if the board wishes to um, go into exec session to discuss okay. further. Okay, and I'm not seeing that from the board in, uh, uh, on that. Uh, so, uh, uh, with that in mind, I uh, uh, need, uh, let's see, let me just make sure I'm doing the process correctly. Uh, it's not necessarily a hearing uh, that we have, so we can go to an action associated with this. I need an action. Uh, Supervisor Horstman. Yes, um, I uh, would at this time move uh, that we approve resolution 2021-38 amending and reapproving the tax rate structure for fiscal year 2021-22 and tax year 2021 for all special taxing jurisdictions for which Coconino County has the authority to collect taxes and that we approve the new resolution of tax. All right, I'm motion by Supervisor Horstman. I need a second. Second. Second by Vice Chair Fowler. Um, all in favor of the motion, vote aye. 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 Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, Great to see you, Sarah. Thank yes. You. Thank you. Good seeing you all. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. All right. We've worked our way through um, our regular uh, pieces of business. Um, and we do have the opportunity to work on a round table or take a break at this point. Um, and I'm ready to keep rolling on if the rest of the board members are uh, ready to keep rolling on. Uh, how Let's do you feel about that? Let's keep That's, rolling on. All right, Patrice, Geronimo, you good? Keep going, Lena? You good? And Judy? Okay, well, it looks like we're gonna keep rolling on. Um, okay, uh, and so, uh, let's see. I'm looking at uh, probably item 52, our county manager's uh, report to us. Steve, am I catching you off guard? Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and actually what I could do is I could roll this down to round table and get the, we haven't done round table in a long Steve. time. That'd okay. Okay. Uh, go through it numerically. Uh, go with di uh, District One at this sure, point. I'll be, I'll be happy oh, to start I'll, it. I'll out. switch it up next time. Okay. We'll roll through. You can, you can switch it out now if you want. I don't care. <laughs> well, like, yeah, let's do that. We'll, we'll go to District Two. We'll put Geronimo on the spot here. All right. Well, I see how it is, guys. <laughs> Just when I'm writing my notes to get ready. Um, so I'll, be glad, I'll be glad to do it if you want. I just. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. I'm, up to you all. So obviously in the last couple of weeks, the big the big thing has been the uh, the flood event that happened a week ago. Uh, so I've been involved in Facebook Live, getting the word out to the community, uh, going in and checking out some of the damage on multiple occasions. Also participating in the, the volunteer day on Saturday, uh, had the opportunity to, uh, to take a tour with uh, uh, Vice Chair Fowler and Coral Evans around the, the Sunnyside neighborhood, got to tour Mild School, Killick Elementary School and see the damage firsthand. Uh, it was sad to see that the, the building will be uh, demolished soon or retired soon uh, due to the, the damages. And so the community is, uh, the Killips having to move uh, they're having a fundraiser for Killip tonight at, at Fratelli's Pizza. 
10% of all proceeds will go to Killip. So if you get an opportunity, please go support Killip uh, in their, their fundraising for school supplies and helping teachers get kind of back on their feet. Um, we have a couple of funds out there for, for residents that are dealing with, with uh, issues of, of damage from the flooding with their homes and can't stay in their homes. So please, if you have the opportunity to, uh, to donate to the United Way or to the Arizona Community Foundation funds, please do so. We do have lots of families that are impacted by damage to their homes and are having to live elsewhere in difficult situations. And so please come uh, help out where you can. Um, and then some of the other things that I have attended, I, I did um, this weekend, NAU had a welcome back. And so I, I had the opportunity to, to say a few words and, uh, uh, regarding voting rights and, and just ethnicity and, and uh, not ethnicity, excuse me, ethnic studies and kind of what uh, for students of color coming to NAU, what the opportunities are to get involved in their community. And so I think that's really important because a lot of times NAU brings these students from other places where they're majority communities and then they come here and they find out that they're a minority community and they don't know how to respond and they feel disconnected. And so working on that retention piece. And I also had the opportunity to attend the Nuestra Saices uh, Tardiada and, and that was a lot of fun. Got to see um, uh, some dancers and mariachis. And so it was good to see the community out and, and uh, celebrating, you know, I kept hearing from people, it's so nice to see everybody and not be at a funeral, you know, and I think in this day and age that that kind of resonates with folks. And so, um, yeah, the majority of my time's really been just out there with the community, trying to be supportive and, and make sure that we're getting services to where we need to. So, thank you. All right. Well, through District 4, Supervisor Begay, Judy. We have Supervisor Begay out there. I'm here, but what are, where are we on the agenda? We are going through roundtable at this point. Oh. Report out on your district. Do you need a minute? Um, yeah. Okay, I'll row through to District 5, uh, uh, Vice Chair Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. I, um, it's been pretty busy uh, with, uh, <laughs> it's silly to say that, huh? <laughs> with the floods going on. And then um, I had... Um, Congressman O'Halloran staff that uh, came out. Congressman was called back to DC, so he was not able to join us. So we took a tour of my district. Um, we I had two of his staff that that came along, met with the Navajo um, Navajo Business Association, uh, talking about the small business and just how they're. Their businesses are, are um, have been through the pandemic. We helped them with some grants. Um, now, um, where are they? And um, have some of the um, the you know actions from Congress been able to come out into our rural counties? That was really the the, the focus and some of the needs that are um, that may be addressed through the federal or if we can assist from the county. We met with the, um, the, the Marble Canyon development, which we approved, and they are waiting for their water rights transfer to happen to the, to the developers, and that's what's going on there. Just had a meeting with Steve and just updated him, our county manager. Um, the you know drought is the main issue and the low level of the uh, lake, um, the, if it, if it keeps dropping, water might, might, temperature might increase. It's going to impact our fishing industry in the Lee's Ferry area. Um, the, there was a great impact by the fire that happened on the, um, uh, on Jacob Lake and Kaibat National Forest there. Uh, and just the impact on the ranchers, um, the Jacob Lake, um, the, facility there, the RV park, uh, 
And so that was a big discussion. But part of that, again, is the drought, the beetles, uh, bark beetles moving in uh, and just seeing how the federal agencies might be able to better address some of the issues that are in that area. Water lines have been taken out, fences for the, um, for the livestock has been um, blown out, the power lines, there are a lot of needs in that area. Um, the National Park Service, uh, North Rim, uh, they, we continue to work to extend that to be a year around, uh, to have it stay open year around. And a, our NAU study um, shows that if it was to stay open year around, it would generate more than $14 million a year to that region. And businesses would be able to keep their employees employed for um, a year around. Um, just the positive impact is really um, great in the area. And um, the National Park Service continues to work on it, but it's going to be, it's going to take several years. There are just great needs that need to be addressed first, which is the water lines, sewer lines, just the basic infrastructure. Um, we met with the Kaibat Paiute. Um, there's, you know, they're in, our, in, in the county part of it is. And it was really good to hear from them. Great uh, broadband, of course, and a cell tower is needed there so that they might be able, we couldn't even call out there. Um, all around, just the uh, great need for the cell towers. Um, North Rim, of course, there is no broadband. If you get something, you get it from the South Rim. Um, the Jacob Lake, and there were some, some team that came together was able to um, put up a Verizon tower. And that's what you get if you're driving near Jacob Lake. Um, Fredonia, of course, the great need and the brought, what was brought up there, which was really interesting. And this is a true for our, our small communities is that, you know, even if there was a grant, how are they supposed to come up with a matching grant? That is um, something that is, I think our small towns are in great need of right now. Um, of course, you know, tourism is down and um, how, 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 do we, how do we attract more business? There's no international tourism. Um, so, and you see the, we met up with the BLM director, Michael Herter, and you see the, um, the wave right behind me um, 240,000 permits um, that are being um, requested right now. Um, and the, the process has changed. There are um, more online to be um, purchased and then some that are going to be uh, in person. And they're still trying to set it up where it is uh, an app where, with the purchase where, where it is um, like a 200 mile radius or 100 mile radius, a geo app. They're still working on that. Um, and the infrastructure for the wave, people hiking in, um, they're still um, working on that. And there's more needs for rangers that we have, we as a board have already um, made it known to Congress and was our resolution was adopted through NACO to support federal, our federal agencies to be able to hire um, the, the rangers and the law enforcement that is needed. So um, we need to continue to lobby for that. The other thing that is a great need on these federal agencies is that even though they get the local hire, that only means a 30 mile radius. So that needs to be addressed where it is going to be more than 30 miles. Most communities are um, more than 30 miles away. Uh, as we um, move forward, we need to make sure that we also work to um, address that and help them to advocate on their behalf. So that's something the federal agencies are working on. Um, the Lake Powell is very low. As you all know, the ramps are closed and um, it's gonna take a, lots of 
funding and they have to write for, for grants as well to be able to address some of those needs. There are two ramps that are, looks like it's gonna be able, they're gonna be able to use it, the legacy ramps um, near Wawi and the other one is by state line. And those are the ones that are being used right now. Um, the, even the, um, so the, it's, it's constantly changing. The, the lake is dropping. Um, there are no international, um, international visitors. It's all domestic. Do uh, we met with the Navajo businesses? Uh, and and um, we heard the same, same, you know, just really trying to address how do we get um, these small businesses um, make sure that their language is in such a way. And then the banking too, making sure that they're able to work with banks and uh, that are able to address some of their needs. Um, the Chamber of Commerce, we met with them. The, um, the nonprofit organization, Glen Canyon um, Conservancy, just as the Grand Canyon Association. Uh, we have one in Fort Lake Powell in that region. They have 11 stores, but only six are open. So there continues to be, um, you know, just the economic on the economy side you know, the businesses are not able, are not doing, um, you know, they're not at full capacity. They're not able to hire all the staff that they need. Um, so, and then staff transportation is a great need. Housing is a great need and childcare is a great need. Um, so those are the continued um, issues that keep coming up as we all know, and we've all heard it before. So those are some of the, um, some of the issues that were brought up. Um, so that's, uh, for now, I think that would be my, my update. And we are um, still trying to work um, with other agencies, um, and we have um, we have canceled the Navajo Bridge Star Party. We're going to have that on October eighth, and that's going to be canceled just because of the continued increase in the um, COVID. Uh, we have Justice Court, um, Flagstaff Justice Court, and the Flagstaff City uh, Court hearing will be held in Tuba City October fourteenth, from two to four. And we have it at Mokopi Legacy Inn because most of the uh, facilities are closed in that area, but we were able to, um, and the Navajo Nation Court, we usually have it there, but they're closed. So we decided to have it at the Legacy Inn. Um, we are working with the USDA and EDA. We're gonna be taking them out as well. So we're gonna be, um, we'll provide more information when that comes together. So that'll be my report and it was a little lengthy, but thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, yes, very busy. Uh, just report, ready, Jay? Uh, yes, um, good morning, everyone. Um, I had two agendas here and I was trying to follow one, I guess I, but anyway, um, well, uh, flood, dish, uh, flood issues. Um, all on the northern part, north northeast part of the reservation. Um, took a lot of effort, and um, as of today, uh, there's a lot of um, areas that really need to be cleaned up, and uh, the, the ones that's really popping up are the roads and the bridges that washed out. And so um, we're trying to work with uh, Navajo, Nation, Navajo Nation, NDOT, and BIA in order to see what can be done. Uh, apparently, BIA, uh, the roads belong to BIA in, in certain those areas. So we've been constantly in touch with them regarding um, how we, that can be addressed for the constituents. Um, there are a lot of issues and concerns regarding that, and now we're constantly getting um, emails and phone calls, you know, to to get that addressed because that's their way of getting to a safe um, for safety reasons and educational reasons and uh, other reasons, you know where uh, um, the, uh, it's needed. So, um, and that, you know, as you know, we, uh, our, the district had um, pretty much um, 
had sandbags and, you know, uh, water and things delivered to them and things like that too. So that was um, 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 done. So I'm thinking, I've been telling people that they probably need to get ready for any more other ones that are coming up and that, you know, we need to be um, proactive and not reactive in anything that comes in, in this form. Um, and then also the drought, um, um, we got some rain, uh, which was good, and people are happy. We're getting a little bit grass out there, but you know, um, the drought is still in, uh, um, uh, evident in a lot of areas in District 4. Um, and then also um, um, the rural broadband, SpaceX, uh, we're contacting families um, in, nor um, in, in northern part of the district. And um, so that's something that we're working on right now. Um, on the, um, uh, there's a lot of issues and concerns um, by, by constituents that were going on way back, years back, and um, a lot of it's coming our way. We're trying to um, address those issues and um, uh, they're all in writing. And so we're trying to respond to each. And I wanna say thank uh, Sue and also um, um, Lucinda, you know, and helping us to address those um, uh, to see if anything was done with that or um, what, what needs to happen. So they've been very helpful to me. Um, we've been meeting with the Nav uh, Navajo Power uh, Organization regarding uranium um, findings in um, Cameron and Comay, uh, uh, yeah, Cameron area and um, parts of the reservation, which is in District 4. And um, their report was given to us um, I believe it was last week, Thursday. I can't remember what day it was, but I um, that they came on and they gave us a report and we had the chance to answer questions at that point in time. I uh, met with the Monkopi people that are living down in Monkopi where the floods came. Um, their, the floods came through and um, took, took down some of their plants and, and corn and squash and, and it, it, it kind of ruined in some area. So, they're needing also help, you know, to see how they can um, prevent that from happening again. So um, in Cameron, uh, police housing, they 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 they're wanting they're wanting to put um, a, a fire station there and then also a um, police uh, housing in the area. So we're trying to help them to see how, what can be done, you know, to start that off the ground. Um, a lot of it's um, utilities that you know they're they're concerned about, but. Other, they're getting help from other people also. So um, basically, um, um, the, um, the Donning Park area plan, pretty much the draft is kind of finalized to the end, which is good. And I'm really happy to see that, you know, that's, that's uh, gonna be, uh, that's being worked on. And I wanna thank all the people that were involved in that, um, the committee that's been at this for, for, for quite some time. So. Those are some of the things that uh, we're looking at right now, but um, a lot of emails coming in, a lot of issues, concerns, and I know that uh, my colleagues also have that same thing coming to them. So, but but it's it is a lot of work, and then also um, and the Navajo Nation, I think, is in the process of sh um, uh, shutting down in certain areas again. I'm not sure how that's going to affect, but I heard heard that from. Um, uh, a staffer with the Navajo Nation. So been working uh, diligently with um, the um, Teresa Galvin on some of the issues that are coming up too and um, the Navajo Nation NDOT and stuff like that. So, and so I just want to say um, it, it is very stressful at times, but you know, we're here to see what we can do to advocate for the, for the issues that are coming to us and see how we can help and and uh, help uh, the constituents out there. So thank you very much. All right, always busy, isn't it? All right, Mr. Klein, Patrice. All right, I'm still ready. So we'll go forward. Um, you know, obviously since uh, the, uh, an emergency has arisen in district one and two because of the museum fire and the post wildfire flooding, a lot of uh, certainly my time and I know uh, Supervisor Vasquez's time has uh, uh, taken place uh, helping and addressing community needs and concerns and also working in partnership 
uh, with the city of Flagstaff to try to uh, address many of these individual needs. And we discussed that, I think, yesterday pretty thoroughly. Um, and I want to again thank, you know, uh, Andy from the city and Lucinda from the county. And um, I, I can just say that the city and the county working together and cooperating together has really been essential to really address the emergency that's arisen. So I really appreciate everybody's extraordinary efforts on this. Um, last week, um, Supervisor Vasquez and myself joined Flagstaff Mayor Paul Deasy on a Facebook Live to discuss the 200 year historic flood event uh, that had occurred uh, outside of the Museum of um, Scar area and also to address uh, some of the ongoing flooding and mitigation efforts within the museum um, uh, post wildfire flooding area as well. Uh, and it was wonderful to hear from the experts from the city and the county and also discuss to also discuss the joint response um, from the city and county. Uh, so again, I want to thank everybody. And I, I really also want to point out that our representatives, both Senator Mark Kelly and Senator Cinema and their staff have really been on this and contacting us uh, and wanting to know how can we help. Uh, Senator Cinema's staff was there last week and, and both uh, Chair Ryan and myself uh, had an opportunity to discuss this with them and also discuss the importance of uh, forest restoration and forest management and the need for the money for forest restoration and management so that we are not fighting these fires and we are not dealing with this post, uh, uh, post uh, fire flood mitigation that costs substantially more than the initial forest restoration um, would be. So I really want to thank uh, both Senator Kelly and Senator Sinema and their staff, as well as Representative Tom O'Halloran. They have really risen to the occasion and done what they could to help us here in Northern Arizona. So um, that's important to really acknowledge them. Um, as the board is aware, I also sit on uh, the NACO public lands and also on WIR. Uh, just kind of an update to everybody. Um, you probably have heard that PILT, which is so important for us here in uh, Coconino County, was reauthorized for two years. And uh, Secure Rural Schools, we are in the process uh, working with both NACO Public Lands in presenting a formula uh, for a distribution of SRS funds that are set forth in the Senate's infrastructure package. This deal is a three-year extension for SRS funds, uh, which is so important for us here in Coconino County uh, because it brings in, SRS funding brings in approximately $2.6 million annually. Um, and this uh, infrastructure um, bill uh, also provides an annual, uh, or ends, I should say, that annual reduction in SRS funding that we have basically experienced since 2017. So it's really important uh, legislation that's coming before a uh, House of Representatives for passing. Uh, and uh, it also has in it monies available for broadband, which I know is near and dear to many of our hearts uh, here that serve uh, rural Arizona. Um, also last week, happy National Health Center Week. For those who missed it, uh, I was able to attend the National Health Center Week celebration at North, North Country Healthcare was able to present on behalf of Coconino County, uh, thanks to uh, North Country uh, for all of their efforts in joining us uh, with vaccine outreach here in Coconino County and for their efforts uh, helping Coconino County in the COVID-19 response. Um, and last but not uh, least, um, actually two more items, uh, both uh, a number of the supervisors, both uh, Chair Ryan and Supervisor Begay and myself attended the Diablo Trust Recreational Summit um, here in Coconino County at the Elks Club. Um, I was looking forward to attending that summit. It was excellent and very well attended. Uh, probably over 100 people there uh, discussing uh, the benefits and joys as well as the challenges in Coconino County being a recreation based um, uh, economy and uh, concerns that we all face 
because of our, our lands and our areas being uh, loved by uh, people. And we need to take better care and stewardship for uh, this increased activity on our uh, lands and recreational areas. And also uh, discuss the developing uh, a, uh, a recreation area comprehensive plan as maybe possibly Coconino County's uh, comprehensive plan. Uh, the unfortunate part of those great to see everybody and great for all of us to be together um, immediately upon leaving that uh, incredible summit. Uh, we uh, received an email that somebody had tested positive uh, who had attended the event. And so uh, the, the uh, three supervisors who all attended, we were all in quarantine for a while. And uh, uh, good to say that we all have uh, tested negative uh, for COVID, but it really underscores the need that we have to continue to do what we can to get shots in arms. Uh, the pandemic still is ongoing and very strong here in Coconino County. And I know we're going to hear from Kim Musselman on that. And um, uh, it's very unfortunate because, again, this doesn't need to be happening. Um, and then just last is Four Fry. Um, Four Fry, the uh, RFP that we've all been waiting for uh, for quite some time, has been delayed yet again. Um, and they're saying that the RFP will be uh, issued sometime the end of September. To be honest with you, I don't know if I trust that. It has just been delayed so many times. And the unfortunate part is by that delay, it's delaying uh, us moving forward um, uh, under the Four Fry project to really work on forest restoration and forest managements. Um, also the old growth uh, forest burnt corral tour uh, that we were going to go uh, to, I guess uh, last week was, um, was canceled due to COVID-19 concerns and I'm sure will be rescheduled. And then this really is the last, uh, Chair Ryan. Um, I believe that uh, what was being referred to also by Vice Chair Alina Fowler, and, and I know we brought up a few times, and if the county manager is still on, hopefully he'll hear this or somebody can maybe let him know. We have brought up, and I think it's important, we do not lose sight of the fact that we need to get a Coconino County Flood Control District meeting and invite all of the mayors and individuals from the municipalities throughout Coconino County. And I know that was done last year. Um, I, I know uh, that it, people appreciated it. And I think we just can't lose sight of the fact that we need to be able to communicate countywide on what the Flood Control District is doing uh, and what its priorities are and to hear from the various municipalities and other people throughout the county. Uh, I, I think that communication is important. So uh, hopefully sometime, if, if we can quit having all these emergencies, it would be a, a wonderful thing for us to try to get that together. So thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Patrice. And uh, yeah, kind of following up on that, uh, you know, that's kind of going a little bit with the chair's reports. Uh, um, uh, but it but it does overlay uh, the flood control district. It's one that we do need to get to uh, on it. Uh, the other piece of it, though, is uh, I mean, as we were listening to last night, and y'all are aware, uh, we have that emergency uh, that's going on, uh, and it's quite demanding on our staff right now. So you know for. Uh, Steve said for the rest of the organization, um, we do need to have that conversation. But I also would suggest that uh, we need to give it time, uh, give it time for, we gotta get past these emergencies. It's, it's kind of all hands on deck. What do you do? How do you, how do you deal with it? Uh, the other piece of it is, uh, uh, yeah, countywide, but countywide is, it's a flight control district. It actually is delineated in specific boundaries, uh, you know, just by statute associated with it. And so we will have limitations associated with, uh, um, you know, what we do and how we do uh, uh, based on, on the area that it does cover. Uh, we've, we've been doing uh, quite a bit uh, as noted, and, you know, I'll just start rolling into uh, um, my, my pieces. Um, uh, a piece of it, as you noted, uh, uh, Patrice, uh, uh, Senator Cinema, uh, her staff was here. 
uh, a big piece of what's going on out there. I, I sit on uh, a lot of the transportation committees. So infrastructure, um, you know, normally we'll get our updates on legislative. We're kind of in a pause right now, uh, but they're awful close uh, to getting uh, uh, infrastructure uh, through Congress. Uh, Senate, gone through the Senate. Um, uh, Senator Sinema was a, a most important leader uh, in that conversation, and it could greatly uh, benefit Arizona, provided it gets through the House. Uh, Senate worked with the president, uh, so you know it's all all sensitive. But but uh, in terms of how it'll get through the House, can they get bipartisan support, move it through, and match it up well with the Senate bill? Uh, but those are key pieces uh, that have been parts of the discussions uh, in the transportation arena. So I sit on the NACOG uh, uh, Transportation Advisory Committee. Those have been our discussions. The other piece of our discussions have been uh, as it relates to, uh, so the state budget, normally for transportation, the best way to get money distributed is use your professionals, advance your recommendations through your engineers, put it before your transportation board, and then have money allocated to those projects. And or the local monies that come in, uh, we use them. We get our HERF money, and our HERF money is specific to specific road miles, uh, specific populations. Uh, each jurisdiction gets their allocation associated with that. Uh, so ours is uh, unincorporated, is separate from uh, uh, city pieces uh, uh, with it. Um, so anyway, um, uh, with the earmarks going through uh, and not having it orchestrated through the normal engineering process, uh, we made recommendations with the rural COGS and MPOs uh, to suggest for next year, why don't we uh, use our organizations, use our engineers within the organizations, uh, put a list together through uh, the jurisdictions and have prioritization occur. X amount for Coconino County, broadly Coconino County, not Coconino County uh, unincorporated, um, uh, Apache County, et cetera. Uh, go and do that. And the same thing for the MPOs. Uh, they get a, a certain allocation based on population, et cetera. Uh, and then make a recommendation for projects. So that is the idea that's, that's moving forward, uh, that we use our engineers to make recommendations. If you're gonna do earmarks, then put it where it's needed. And so we can have a, joke, a, a local influence on what's happening. So uh, that's what TPAC uh, did for NACOG, FMPO did it for MPO. Um, we are uh, at the Rural Transportation Advisory Council. Uh, we took a look at, uh, we're, we're, uh, we put together a resolution. That resolution will be fed out to everybody uh, on, on those recommendations uh, that are occurring with it. The, um, uh, the other thing with uh, Rural Transportation Advisory Council is they're, they're gonna have a retreat in the fall. And so we're prepping for that. And it's time to bring everybody together. And there, there's been a big changeover. There are more MPOs out there. There's a bunch of new staff, new elected. It's time to look at our own vision within RTAC and uh, what are we doing? How are we working together? What's our priority? We have a conference that we put on each year. How important is that versus our legislative? Let's go through those conversations. Uh, so those are some of the committees that I'm spun off to and reporting back on that. Uh, the other one that you're all aware of, but just a reminder, CSA so far is still planning, as I understand, uh, their conference at, begins at the end of September, I believe, September 29th. So that one's coming along. So, you know, we should be positioning ourselves uh, for that. We've already started looking at uh, legislative at the last meeting that we had, and we have time between now and then, uh, but that's an important one. Um, just a, a Reminder, I'm going to go away for about 10 days and, and take a trip I was supposed to go on uh, last year pre-COVID and see if I can. Uh, uh, so I'm going to be gone mid-September, uh, I think the 16th through the 27th, somewhere around there. Uh, in terms of my district, um, 
the uh, uh, Williams uh, is having a stand down for veterans. So we'll try and get the information out to you. And these are usually uh, homeless veterans. That's the focus. It's not just homeless veterans. Stand down, move from Flagstaff out to Williams, uh, uh, but it's it's happening. Uh, so uh, we'll get the information out to you, so you can get it out to the veterans you might know. Um, for the information they provide associated with services, uh, they're having that. Uh, they're also having a Patriots Day parade. I, uh, we ran, have a resolution that we've had for the past few years that I'm asking that we can have on our agenda. Um, uh, coming up that you'll see associated with Patriot Day. That's that's looking at 9-11 uh, and the impact and, and recognition associated with that. Uh, another note, uh, Dirk Foreman, uh, long-term fire chief for uh, Highlands Fire Department, a uh, big player with a lot of our fire discussions, uh, uh, forestry, etc. cetera, uh, uh, forming the Highlands District. He was uh, a big part of that. He's retiring. Uh, so I want to uh, bring a recognition forward associated with him, uh, and that uh, that'll come uh, with September 7th. Um, uh, issues that are occurring uh, further out in the district, as we heard with the Diablo Trust uh, meetings, uh, uh, the uh, and we are all hearing it. Uh, as Judy was saying, we get a lot of phone calls. Uh, a lot of ours are associated with speeding everywhere. It's happening everywhere. Uh, it's out in Kachina, it's out in Mount Nair, it's out in Belmont. Um, uh, that uh, trash, uh, litter uh, that's occurring, uh, the camping in the forest, the impact, the razors, uh, and the OHVs. So uh, we're hearing it from all our communities. So I could say it's it's spread throughout my district and, and that's going on. And, and it is one of our areas that it's almost at a crisis state. What do we do with this metro population that's showing up? And uh, how do we address it with our regional partners? Because we can't handle it alone as Coconino County. Uh, and, and, you know, they were the piece of the Diablo Trust discussions, but it plays out even more broadly beyond uh, what they're talking about in other areas in everybody's districts. Uh, so that's, that's a big one uh, that's happening. Uh, heads up, uh, Park CEO Key um, uh, that went through and was approved by planning and zoning is coming forward. So I've been hearing from parks. I'm getting emails from there. Um, we did more recently get a grant. So I think I may have brought it up last meeting. Uh, I'll bring it up. Uh, the rail study for Belmont uh, has been approved. Uh, and so that'll be coming before us uh, in the near future. Uh, that that we will be awarded that grant. So we need to run it before the board and make sure everybody's good with that. But uh, uh, good work, uh, Chris Pastorts on that. That's a broader regional economic development component. And then um, a few things on the chair's report. Uh, reminder, Steve's re uh, check-in, uh, re review, but it's more of a check-in, uh, is uh, we're scheduling for August 31st. Uh, looks like everybody can attend that one. And so we'll be checking in uh, a little bit, just thinking about that as you prepare and uh, have conversations with Steve as we lead up to that. Um, uh, as Geronimo had mentioned, uh, I was invited as chair to go to the Southside Rec uh, uh, Welcome Back NAU. Um, uh, and, uh, and there was an accident on I-17 that uh, prohibited me from doing that, which uh, actually allowed me to pass the torch to Geronimo, which why well, I was asking Deb Harris if it'd be okay if I passed it over and she wanted the chair, but I couldn't make it. So Geronimo filled in on, uh, on behalf of us to welcome any of you back through the Southside organization. And, uh, uh, and there's plenty more going on, but we haven't had a chance for a, a prolonged round table in, in a bit. And you know, you've all been busy in your own districts. Um, what I'll do, it uh, looks like we've uh, wrapped our way through the chair's report, all the district reports. Now we can swing back to uh, uh, Steve uh, under item 52. Uh, uh, Lena, did you want to bring up, before we go there, go ahead, Lena. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to go back to the flood district. The reason why I brought it up, I didn't mean to open up a conversation during the, um, just the consent agenda, but 
Neil, um, you just said that we need to prepare, uh, you know, and we are, we have to prepare our, ourselves, position ourselves to be able to take advantage of some of these bills that are coming through the um, infrastructure bill. Yeah. Some of the flood district projects out in the communities are infrastructure. If we were to meet with our communities, then we may be able to identify some of those and be able to save some, well, what's left of the district money, I guess, and be, take advantage of some of these bills uh, that are going through. I think an evaluation, I know we've been evaluating, maybe another one needs to be done to see what is needed out there. Maybe we need to do that. And that was one of the reasons why I took Congressman O'Halloran out to put, um, prepare the communities to be able to know where and how to access some of these um, um, legislations and bills that benefit, supposed to benefit community, how they can access it. Uh, one of the just, we are very fortunate, I have to say, that our congressional delegation is very responsive. They're um, very, their mind and they're planning and they want to listen to what is needed at the local level. Uh, I had Cong um, Senator Kelly's uh, staff, Coral Evan, was with us at, in Page, uh, you know, just being able to be available and to listen, to be able to to hear what the needs are, right down to a small business, an individual business that is um, not that was not able to access the small business administration benefits. How do we do that? So um, that's that's something that I just want to add on. Um, that's why I was talking about the flood district, um, <clears throat> and then climate. You know, th this we have major fire that happens that blows up right before our eyes and we can see it. And then we have um, flood, it can see it impacts communities. You, know, you have, you know, stage one, stage two, whatever the thresholds are. But we have another um, actually an emergency going on and it has been for the last 20 years is the drought. So how do we as, as a county address that? What is, what is our approach? That's, I think that goes back to the flood district again, you know, where um, that, partly that, but at the same time, it's impacting our economy. So um, just wanna just um, mention that. I think we need to really look at and evaluate things, maybe look at things differently than the way it's been defined to be able to address some of these needs that are in our community. Um, and it's throughout our whole county. Uh, and, and yet we have a lot more visitors coming. We, how do we address some of those and help our partners and work with our partners to be able to um, address some of the issues that are coming before us right now or what we see in the community? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Lena. Um, yeah, great. Ryan? Yeah, I'll I just want to add a little bit to what Lena has said, and I think that's where um, I was going with that too. Um, I did speak to um, <clears throat> um, Mr. Peru regarding uh, uh, what we just what was just now brought up, and um, I think a lot of it has to do with policies that we may have, and um, and um, I I've been saying that we should really look at our policies and agreements or whatever we have, you know, to, to make it workable. I think we might just be tying our own hands in certain areas. So that's all I want to add. Thank you. All right. Uh, which is good. You know, opportunity for our discussions, which eats fill into uh, uh, future opportunities that we have discussions. And for Steve, this is lining up well for Steve's report because we have the infrastructure stuff that we're all trying to keep an eye on while we also have uh, ARPA going through. And uh, I'll go to item number 52, Steve. Uh, first of all, let's start with sharing the, the planning calendar. We can look at board items for the next few weeks. And Lindsay, can you do that, please? Yes, give me one minute Share my screen. And I'm hoping it comes up because last time it didn't work when I was streaming, but I see it. So hopefully this will work. Okay. We can see it. 
Yay, okay. Okay, you can scroll down. Of course, we're in October 24th today. So just scroll on down. So uh, for the 31st, of course, we've got um, executive session and that's to, to uh, discuss my performance evaluation at that time or check-in, if you will. And so um, we'll be putting together a discussion agenda uh, to measure, uh, to assess uh, performance in the manager's office. And so that's on the, 20, on the 31st. Also on that date though, uh, did Bob Holmes and Anna Ma from our federal consultants, Nexus, are going to be in town and I know we're looking at possibly putting together individual meetings to check in but in the interest if we cannot do that we may be looking at a full board meeting to discuss congressional issues and so we'll, it'll depend on calendars and schedule for that day uh, but I know that we put at least an hour and a half uh, to discuss uh, manager performance but again we'll, we're working with your district, district directors to see if we can uh, what we can do. But again, if we can't get you all into, for individual uh, district meetings, we'll be uh, convening a full board meeting to, to address that issue. Uh, from there on September 7th, we have a, proclam a couple of proclamations and you can see that on your screen. And then on the 7th of September uh, for the American Rescue Plan, uh, we're gonna do a brief check-in on that today, but we'll, we're gonna be asking for additional time for that particular item. Uh, the plan is for the staff to present to the board uh, recommendations for the first phase of funding decisions. And the first phase of funding decisions will also include some of the budget increments that we did delay as a result of not knowing or learning more about what the ARP guidelines were. And so we do have uh, budget increments. We also have categories where we've had discussions with the organization as it relates to uh, uh, COVID response, relief, some of the wor work that we're doing in HHS, also looking at the criminal justice system and to address uh, some of the case flow, uh, uh, the case flow uh, volume that we have in that particular part of the county system. Also looking at some of the, um, uh, some of the recommendations that we would have rel related to facilities, specifically HVAC upgrades and changes, again, to deal with COVID related uh, impacts uh, and a few other areas, parks and recreation, superintendent of schools, um, a couple of others. And so uh, that's gonna be an expanded discussion, but prior to that, uh, staff is going to be working to with, the, with your district directors to schedule time so we can provide individual briefings so that you are well-armed and well-informed of those discussions by the time we get to September 7th. And so that's the prep that's happening with regard to ARP. Uh, from there, of course, uh, uh, Treasurer Benatar is going to be providing her annual report to the board on the 7th of September, and then we can scroll down. Uh, Chris Pastors is going to be providing an economic development program update, uh, looking at the projects that he's been working on uh, in, in each of the districts, but also looking at some of the countywide initiatives related to economic development and his activity there. Uh, Kim will provide, of course, a COVID update. Uh, and then on the, uh, for legislative updates, uh, I want to include the issue of redistricting. So redistricting, of course, is taking place as we, as we speak uh, at the state and federal level. Uh, the Independent Redistricting Commission had a series of listening tours throughout the state in the last few weeks. Uh, they've asked for, for jurisdictions and, and interest, interested parties to sub, submit maps. Uh, we'll be working with, uh, your, with your schedules. Uh, and, the, and the consultants that we've engaged uh, so that we can identify some mapping scenarios. Those scenarios, of course, would need to come back to the full board uh, for review and discussion prior to them being sent as a, as a recommendation from Coconino County. So that's what's happening with regard to the state and congressional redistricting. And then there's local redistricting. So census numbers uh, came out last week we're in the process of get, putting those census numbers into precincts. And so there is a bit of analysis and, 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 and some processing that needs to play, take place. And G County GIS is working on that right now. Uh, but with, what we're gonna be presenting on the 7th is the county's redistricting plan and the process. And that'll include the public input process. It'll provide also information regarding each of the districts as the population has come out. And you'll know historically Coconino County's uh, growth has shown that we see growth in District 3, 
uh, in, in probably district one. Uh, other districts remain either the same or they drop in, in, in population. That's probably gonna be the case again. And so the just redistricting process that we go through is to balance the population of the county with the five districts uh, and using a 5% margin plus or minus. And so uh, I think the target population uh, of course, will be presented to you once we get the final numbers from, from, from county GIS, but we're also waiting on Census Bureau to, to release more information. And so they're feeding information. Uh, we will have, of course, additional information by then. But my point being is that county, county, GI, county redistricting is in process. That also includes uh, input and coordination with the community college, because the community college board of, board, governing board shares the same district boundaries as Coconino County. So we're coordinating with CCC on that end too. But again, uh, that's the, the plan for September 7th is to have additional time with the board and to have more in-depth discussions on the topics of congressional, legislative, and then local redistricting. From there, we are going to then be going on to uh, September 14th. And you will see on the screen uh, Title III, uh, that is under consent. Uh, those are title, title three funds, community development. We have Walnut Meadows uh, on that calendar. And then of course, round table. And then just to note uh, some uh, supervisor horsemen will be out of town, unable to attend. And then from there, uh, Chair Ryan will be out of town September 16th through the 26th. On the 28th, you can see that we've uh, had additional time uh, put together for precinct boundaries. And that is a, that's a statutory responsibility that we do need to adopt precincts, not board districts, but the precincts need to be identified by October 1st. Now, that's where it gets a little, con con it gets a little confusing because while we have to adopt precincts by October 1st, as the congressional and legislative districts are set, how they draw those lines can also split precincts because uh, they, you know, it's kind of a, a pecking order. So the congressional and legislative lines uh, can, in some cases, split a precinct, and that that's kind of why. And and that process doesn't end until the end of the year, maybe even the first of January. So that's why when we have to do our adoption of precinct boundaries on October first, that can change as well, just based on the other processes that are taking place. Uh, with regard to redistricting. Uh, and then of course, for American Rescue Plans, we'll be just having the discussion on the external review uh, in terms of opening up the opportunities for community partnerships and, and uh, programs uh, outside of the county to be considered for our funding. And then again, additional information on uh, interaction and discussion on redistricting. Uh, September 29th through the 1st is the summit. And so preparing uh, the board for the legislative summit uh, is going to be part of the process that we're, we'll be looking at uh, for that for those uh, for that session in Prescott, and that's taking place on October. Excuse me, September 29th through October. Uh, October 5th, we've got some items. Of course, uh, facilities master plan. More discussion on ARP COVID update. Of course, those are standing items. Same with legislative, and then I want to jump to the 12th. So the 12th, another, uh, we have Shadow Mountain, uh, the Wells rezoning cases is slated for that evening. And then uh, WIR is taking place October 13th through the 15th. And then one item that's not on here that I want to discuss uh, with, with Lindsay, the clerk and your schedules is that we had discussed putting together a joint meeting of the Coconino Community College District Board and the Board, and the board of Supervisors we're looking at possibly October 20th for that date. That's a Tuesday. Uh, depending on what's happening with COVID, we're looking at that to be a joint in-person uh, meeting um, at CCC. And so those are very preliminary discussions uh, just, to, to, just to put that on the radar. And then I think from there, you see October 26th. A couple of items to note though. Uh, this week on August 26th of this week, uh, CCC will turn 30 years old. Uh, and so I've got my CCC shirt on, see, uh, to celebrate CCC. Uh, there are some events happening this week at the college. And so certainly encourage board members. Uh, there's a, uh, an event happening Thursday 
between four and seven. And then in Page, uh, there's another event happening from four to seven in Page. And again, it's to celebrate the community college's 30th year of doing business and being part of Coconino County. And then one other item to note, another important partner of Coconino County for 50 years is the Hajoni Foundation. And the Hajoni Foundation is turning 50. And I remember when I was at community services back in the early 80s, mid 80s, uh, we did the transportation for the, for the Shoney Foundation back then. And so uh, an important uh, resource for our community for 50 years and want to acknowledge and honor their 50 years of service. And our own Kim Musselman is on the board. Uh, and so I know they're having an event later this week on Friday. And so if you're interested, please let us know. But again, uh, kudos and congratulations to the Shoney Foundation. Okay, uh, from there, Mr. Chair, a couple of other items. Um, we're in the process of, of transitioning the elections function from the recorder's office uh, where it has been uh, a, 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 a contract with the recorder since 1997. And that is in the process of taking place. Uh, so we're, we're creating a couple of positions that are, you know, we have the FTs authorized, but repurposing a position to, to be the elections administrator. And I know that our own Sue Brown is down in Phoenix today, attending with the recorder Hansen, uh, an election center um, conference on election issues and matters. And so uh, that's going to, that's a big project, you know, transitioning a very important function of county um, government uh, to uh, within the organization takes a lot of coordination. And so that's happening in the next uh, couple of years. And I think I'll stop and answer any questions the board may have. All right, questions of Steve, or comments? Go ahead, Patrice. Well, I, I, by the way, I'm sorry, I got thrown off uh, uh, the internet, so I, I missed the last two minutes there, Steve. So I know you were talking about CCC's birthday, and I hope you invited everybody to the birthday celebration. You will send that out, yes. And then Hajoni Foundation is 50 years old this week. Yes, and I'll be there at that as well. Sorry about that, so thanks. thanks. Uh, Mr. Chair, those are the items to report out at this time. Um, and I, in terms of the legislative, I can just add that very quickly in the time that we have a few minutes before noon. Uh, for the legislative, of course, working uh, on the uh, prepping for the CSA uh, summit uh, later in September. Uh, I know that um, there's some congressional uh, letter writing that's taking place uh, related to the museum flood. Uh, forest restoration. I just saw an email that Lucinda and uh, our, and Claire are working on some communications there. Uh, of course, redistricting is part of the legislative function as well. Um, again, there's a few other things happening, uh, but again, uh, I can answer any questions the board may have on terms of legislative or congressional activities. I think right now we're in a pause on, I mean, we have a lot going on and a lot to start, start prepping for, but we're at a good point of we're about all ready to launch into it in the next couple of months. Uh, but uh, for now, it's kind of calm. All right. Well, any questions of Steve on legislative? If not, that wraps up 52, 53, and 54. And if, you know, if we missed an item because we shifted the agenda around and we need to come back, we can, we can bring them back uh, on that. So, uh, if you fell on the spot, you didn't get the right report out there. Um, we'll have that chance. With that, uh, it's 11.52. Uh, we're due back at 1.15, where we have the opportunity to talk about broadband. So uh, we'll go ahead and uh, um, take a break, and we'll come back at 1.15. Great. Thank you. Fantastic.
still want to say we got to get permission from the practice manager to be able to send the records down to us. So we pushed on them and said, hey, if they're here, can you send this stuff down? So we're waiting on that right now. So we get those. And so, so Patrice, did you catch, catch that? No. What happened? Well, so we don't have the results of the biopsy or the cytology at this point in our records. So do we know what this was? Yes, it was. They said it was nothing. There was nothing that showed up. It was sterile. Wait a minute. First, um, Supervisor Horseman, your mic is live. Oh, thank you very much.
seven day week. Hi, Mr. Chair. Hey, Steve. Um, yeah, Patrice was asking if we can pause. Just uh, she's going to be off the phone in just a minute here. Okay. A couple minutes. Sounds good. Yeah, Ryan. I don't see Supervisor Begay yet. Just so you know. Oh, okay. Good. I mean, just in terms of uh, that's the pause. We yeah, we don't want to hear. You're muted anyway. <laughs> That, that was me having fun with Lena. Yeah, the vice chair will note that this county manager had nothing to do with that comment from the chair. <laughs> I thought you told me to. <laughs> yeah. I have to get more District 3 photos. I have Rogers Lake. I mean, I kind of like Veronimo in the same photo up. But I, I at least have my district in there, you know, so. Oh, oh I, that's two. I'm in trouble now. I got two and I'm stirring up. <laughs> and right now we only have three on, so. Yeah, we're, uh, we're taking a few. Uh, Patrice uh, needed about five minutes, uh, roughly. Uh, she's going to hop on. So we're going to start, you know, a little bit late here. It's on last day, I know August. Well, we have a half a second. Lindsay, did I get all the signatures on there? You did very well. Oh, yay. Yeah, hey. <laughs> so I only missed three this time. <laughs> There's Judy. Hey, Judy. Judy, yeah. we're, we're going to start a few minutes late. Uh, Patrice asked if you could pause. Just, uh, uh, she's trying to hop off the phone call. Okay. Where's she? Okay. Oh, bye.
Oh my gosh. So I just uh, started the meeting. I've been waiting for Matt to talk. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll start all over. I just texted my son Matthew again. He said, Dad, you keep texting the wrong Matt. <laughs> well, we're here. We're, we're just waiting for Patrice, Supervisor Horseman. But if you want to get started, we're more than happy to. Yeah, no, we, uh, she and I talk. She, she'll, she'll be on soon. But uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, we need There's a, another map. Like yeah. <laughs> so we're reconvening, and we have it looks like we have Supervisor um, Begay, Vasquez, and Fowler uh, all out there. 
And so, and Supervisor Horstman will join, be joining soon. So, Steve, did you want to, uh, as I had asked before, did you want to say anything for Matt Hopson? I do. And again, I'll stop texting my son, Matthew, because he says, why do you keep texting me and ask me these questions about a, a board meeting? So, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, some, uh, I wanted to offer some introductory comments on this issue um, and, and other issues where, where, you know, broadband, economic development. Uh, there's several other issues, of course, as a county, we're, we're uh, definitely in, 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 the, in, in the driver's seat often. Um, I am on. Thank you. And, and, and of course, today we're going to be talking about broadband. And I want to offer some introductory comments because, you know, as, a, as, a, as an area, whether it's broadband, economic development, other issues, policy areas that the county is involved in, um, we, we often see that there is a broad county purpose, a broad county mission. Uh, you know, a broad county position on, on, on certain topics and broadband is one of those areas where this issue of course came back to the board last year sometime. Uh, and there's been a lot of movement and discussions. Uh, at the same time, we also see as a result of the district system of county government, where certain topics have probably a little more likely to advance in, in some areas, a little further out than other districts and I, I offer this today because providing the opportunity to do an update on, on the policy issue, of course, today's broadband, provides the board the opportunity to, to sync up on what we're doing at the staff level in supporting uh, conversations and initiatives within each of the board districts. Broadband is one of those areas where, where uh, I think we've had the opportunity, uh, opportunities that have come to us. Uh, through relationships and networks, also relationships that each board member have with, with, with that topic or those, 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 uh, those individuals in that topical area where we, see, where we see advancement. And of course, today is the opportunity for us to bring the topic back, uh, provide a broad overview of what that policy was when the board came, when the board discussed this earlier, actually this was last year, and also some, some progress as it relates how that policy or that issue has been progressing since then. And again, broadband is one of those areas where, where we've done some really good work and today it provides the opportunity to, to share with the entire board all of the good things that are happening in various areas of that. There's a lot more to happen, but again, this is a check-in. We're gonna be doing the same thing next month with economic development, where we have, it's a broad policy area. The county has a lot of different roles in that. But again, in some areas, in some districts, we have opportunities to advance that, that topic a little, little, more, uh, little more further, uh, depending on, on, on those uh, um, relationships and network uh, possibilities in each of those districts. So again, just thinking it all up for you. Uh, I was not here when this came to the board last calendar year. I know that, the, and that's part of the presentation today is Matt is gonna be providing uh, some back, the background on that because uh, last year it was a different board back then too. Uh, and so we had to also account for the fact that we have uh, different individuals in board seats as we did uh, you know, last year sometime. So again, my introductory comments are, is, I just wanted to share that with you. Uh, I know that uh, of course, Sue Brown is the deputy county manager that supports the, the IT area and she may have some offer, some thoughts to offer. And then I know, I think Supervisor Fowler, Vice Chair Fowler had her, 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 her video up and may want to offer some comments as well. So Mr. Chair, with your permission, um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on to Sue Brown to make some comments too. All right. Well, Sue's up. Thank you, sir. Uh, my first time, by the way, as a, as a deputy county manager, many times before you as a director, not as a deputy county manager, so thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, um, as Steve said, we're going to offer you today a, a history of the rural broadband initiatives uh, across the northern region, across Coconino County. Uh, a huge thank you to IT Director Matt Fowler, Assistant Director, IT Director Helen Costello, and to Chris Pastors, uh, Economic Development Manager, because they've taken these issues far, um, quite far, and it's their initiative, it's their knowledge, their skill, and getting these things off the ground. And just getting them off the ground is a difficult thing to do. 
They are of a labyrinthine nature. They are very complicated and yet they've managed to do this with um, great support from the board previously, which they'll talk to you about. They'll talk to you about where the projects are now and they'll give you a recommendation of next steps as well. So we're really looking forward to it um, for you hearing all of the things that are happening and for giving your, this board's perspective on how we should move forward. Um, with that, um, Madam Vice Chair, did you wanna speak before Matt started? Thank you. Thank you, Deputy County Manager. Welcome to the team. And it's really great for you to see you um, provide uh, an intro, it's really great. Uh, and thank you, um, Mr. Chair. And I wanna thank our team. These guys are the most dedicated of all the teams, but also in the field of um, IT uh, and very complex. Uh, you know, we keep talking about broadband um, and then there's different levels of broadband. One of um, that we're, usually constant education from Matt. Thank you so much for Matt. It is so great he came to the county with this broad vision. And it's IT, I think before, used to be just a computer system. Our computer, our desktop, the linkage, and you know the, um, the malware, all of that stuff, that was our focus. And Matt comes and blows us out of the water. Says their IT is broadband, and broadband is the biggest issue out here. And Helen, with her knowledge and just her dedication, and just the GIS section, I didn't realize how important all of that was. Knowing, you know, we all know in the business world, in our economy, our e commerce, and everything else, we know the uh, economic development is so important. So we have Chris, we have a great team that is working on this and with many partners it is, and you'll hear that in this presentation. And it just so happens those partners sometimes takes a while to really come together. There are easements, there are grants. These are very, very expensive projects. There's long haul, middle mile, there's the last mile. These are what our citizens needs, our county needs. I just gave a report on our um, district um, tour with Congressman O'Halloran, and that was the main subject, main issue that came out. And if you all tour your district, I know it's just exactly the same. Just the last board meeting, we had issue with our uh, Zoom meeting because of the broadband. Those are those are streaming, and that is what is always an issue. Last night, we had an issue with our city county meeting. So. Broadband is so important. And so I just really support what they're doing. And I really am happy that the Board of Supervisors have always supported them. And I'd like to see us to continue to support a broadband. And I know you all feel that way, but thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Ryan, members of the board, County Manager Peru. Deputy County Manager Brown and uh, all the community partners that we've worked with to date regarding uh, rural broadband. And today we wanna really slow down and kind of pause. Um, technology can be confusing for a lot of people. So we don't wanna overcomplicate today's discussion. We really um, are hoping to make it more of a conversation rather than a presentation. But if at any time, any of the board members wanna have a one-on-one -on -one with Helen and I and or Chris to really get into the weeds about the history of Coconino County and broadband, we're more than happy to set aside that time and educate to the best of our ability of what we know. Um, historically, this has um, been a topic for, for decades uh, for Northern Arizona, so it's not a new topic. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we're gonna dive uh, into today's uh, conversation and presentation. Uh, again, it's going to be myself, Helen Costello, and also Chris Pastures um, to answer anyone's questions today. Uh, on the agenda, we're going to talk briefly about the challenges, the project history, the November um, Board of Supervisors presentation, uh, the project to date, our stakeholder outreach and our website, our staff recommendation to the Board of Supervisors, which is going to be touching on the pursuit of right-of-way, 
Uh, again, we don't want to come today and just talk about um, that being a consent agenda or a, a topic. We really want to educate everyone to better understand what that means and get your feedback on next steps moving forward. Uh, we're also going to talk about SpaceX um, low Earth orbiting satellites and the Starlink updates from the county investments back in May, and then answer any questions um, that the board may have at that time. So the challenge is historic. Um, the, the pandemic really brought this to the surface of how many areas and the inequities across Northern Arizona. Um, coming from a different state and coming to Arizona myself personally, I was really surprised to see the lack of infrastructure um, across the state, uh, specifically within Coconino County. Um, the areas that do have coverage are um, sometimes advertised incorrectly. It might say that they have 25 meg down or 50 meg down, and we actually find that it's much less than that. And really this impacts the quality of life for our citizens um, from a business perspective, economic development, um, unable to leverage technology, autonomous vehicles, education, healthcare, um, and you know, most importantly, public and life safety. So taking a look at the history, um, being new to Coconino County myself and new to Arizona, one of the first things that I wanna do is better understand the challenges and talk with each of the board members. And so when speaking with Supervisor Fowler, um, she had been uh, advocating for high-speed internet um, in the Northern region for many, many, many years. And so she asked if I could uh, partner with her at the Colorado Plateau Economic Development Conference in uh, Page, Arizona. And prior to doing that site visitation, I drove out and I met with the sheriff's office, I met with the police department, I met with various business owners, I met with citizens, and just, you know, the, the theme was, you know, no internet, no, no technology, the lack of, and the frustration, um, actually staying at the hotel for the conference, I didn't have any connectivity, and um, it's just, you know, very, um, it, it's, a, it's a big problem, uh, but not only in page, right? There's several areas across the state and in all of our districts that are facing uh, the same challenge. And so during that um, conference uh, to assist Supervisor Fowler, I introduced um, the SpaceX technology, talking about possible interim solutions. We talked about some existing middle mile fiber projects that we had heard about that would be impacting the area positively. Um, and this was something that had been discussed previously you know, to the constituents over several years. And even though this was my first time at the Colorado Plateau, um, what was really interesting for me is getting the feedback from the community that they were frustrated. They had heard there would be middle mile before and nothing happened. So, you know, you know, what could we do? What could the government do? And so when speaking with Supervisor Fowler and County Manager's office and the board in the past, um, we decided like, why don't we try to find out these numbers ourselves? You know, why don't we swing the bat, do the best that we can, and let's just do a feasibility study. So we applied for the Arizona Commerce Authority $50,000 grant, um, which, we, which we won. At the same time, right after the Colorado Plateau, I reached out to SpaceX, Supervisor Fowler reached out to SpaceX, and together in partnership, we were able to secure an ANGEL account for Coconino County to beta test um, the low earth orbiting uh, satellite technology for, for internet in rural areas. We came back to the board on November 17th of 2020 and um, presented the feasibility study, you know, that Praxis Associates uh, presented on, on our behalf. And ultimately we got the board approval to pursue, to pursue grant funding. Um, immediately after the board's decision, you know, we got started on community outreach, you know, being very transparent, being in public service, set up a website, which we'll show a little bit later and you know, speaking with as many uh, community partners as we possibly could, looking for letters of support. And then of course, we came back to the board and made some SpaceX investments um, on May 6th of 2021. So this is uh, the presentation and I put a, um, a date at the top of each slide so we're not getting confused from today's presentation versus November 17th. Uh, but this is the slide that we started off with, you know, seeking board recommendation. And really it was to set a bold vision to better understand the regional deficiencies regarding you know, all that technology offers. Um, keep in mind, this is something that we were pursuing far before um, you know, the pandemic had hit. And so this really catapulted us in regards to grant opportunities and, and funding um, down the line. And so project, um, the entire project consists of two phases. The first phase is from Flagstaff to the border of Utah. 
And that uh, consists of you know, three different um, node points, which we'll talk about in a second. And the second phase of the project was interconnecting the Four Corners region over into Highway 89 across Highway 160. Um, this again would take you know, community support, um, working with Arizona Department of Transportation, the Sun Corridor, and several other infracom providers, and really bringing public and private entities together to solve some of these regional issues, not just county issues, but regional issues. And so um, we, we seek uh, the board's recommendation and uh, we showed you know, different maps uh, educating that it's 151 lineal miles from Flagstaff to um, the border of Utah. Along that route for uh, Highway 89, we identified what's known in the broadband industry as CAIs, which is a community anchor institution. And those are 53 government um, medical schools, government facilities that provide services to the communities. Um, it's not required that we connect those um, community anchor institutions, but it's always um, highly, you know, uh, it's a value when applying for the grant. Uh, it, it's a positive that we're not just building a fiber network without actually connecting um, businesses, especially around public and life safety or services, you know, for the community. Again, the middle mile project ultimately will serve to last mile providers. Um, and it gets a little confusing with all the terminology, last mile, middle mile, but last mile is really what you have today at your home, right? So like whether you have Suddenlink, CenturyLink, uh, Verizon, that's considered a last mile um, infracom provider. And really what this does is improve speeds, reliability, Creates that, um, and it's really a benefit, obviously, for the last mile providers with, with the county in partnership with the federal government and the state funding to build out a middle mile. It makes it that much more attractive for a last mile provider because they don't have to come up with, with all that capital or else it would be done already. And, and that's you know, why it hasn't been done historically is due to the return on investments for um, private entities. Again, phase two is what I just mentioned. Ironically, it's the same distance, about 151 miles um, north and then 150 mile um, across over to the Four Corners area. Um, the fiber itself is 432 uh, strands of fiber. Uh, majority of middle mile networks, just so you're aware, are typically 288. The reason that we are seeking to do 432 is because the cost of fiber is essentially nothing. It's really the construction, the boring, um, this proposed project is 100% underground, so we don't have to worry about any kind of outages uh, with exception to excavation, but, you know, people shooting at the poles or uh, any kind of um, miscellaneous things that could potentially happen like in a um, city um, with aerial fiber, um, we don't have that in, in, in the actual middle mile, but for the community anchor institutions, it would be too expensive to do everything underground, so of course, on those CAIs, there's, it's gonna be a mix of underground uh, and aerial. Uh, when we worked with Praxis Associates, uh, what they did is came out and you know, performed field surveys. They helped us develop a tentative network design, taking a look at the speeds of the network, the electronics, um, the different node buildings, where those electronics would be stored, identified the CAIs, the community anchor institutions that we just touched on, and kind of helped us you know, create a generic pro forma um, you know, a budget and financial model that we could, you know, come back and better understand of what it would, what it would cost and what it would look like to monetize in order for it to debt service. Each one of these little rectangles that you see um, is a GIS geospatial data um, file that, uh, like this is page 27 here for Tuba City. And this shows us the different 14 community anchor institutions that were identified specifically in Tuba. Uh, in the event that this would move forward, this would be connecting to the interconnect node two, which would be located in Tuba City. And of course, um, the expansion opportunities are, are unlimited with this particular build. Um, again, the reason for the 432 is really uh, like a dig once um, mentality, right? Like we don't want to have to constantly dig up the roads, install new conduit, install new fiber. And with the technology moving as fast as it is and the cost of fiber being um, the least expensive during a build like this, again, that's why we're looking to try to build really a hundred year network if possible. So this picture that you can see on the left side of the screen uh, in the red is phase one. Uh, this shows the node um, in Flagstaff, again, in Tuba City and in Page. In the event that this was approved and we went on to phase two, we would be expanding two additional nodes, one in um, Cayenta and then also in the Four Corners area. Um, this is today's latest state-of-the-art equipment and fiber. 
um, we're talking um, extremely fast um, speeds and can handle any type of internet traffic um, for any type of carrier and or home or business. And taking a look at the total cost of ownership, the business case was positive and uh, presented to the board back in the, uh, November of 2020. Um, the question was why, like, why are we getting involved? What, what, why are we you know, taking a look at this assessment? Not only were we hearing a lot of um, concern from the citizens across Coconino County, but the real reason why we wanted to get involved is because it doesn't exist. Um, typically when fiber is built out, it follows um, railways, you know, the railroad, it follows major interstates. And unfortunately, Arizona is really, um, hasn't been part of any type, type of really large builds historically. And this creates uh, regional pockets of digital desolation. It's basically these islands that have no infrastructure whatsoever. And unfortunately, that's um, the situation for us. And the impact, right? The impact on healthcare, especially during COVID response, um, having people actually have to get in their vehicles to drive to a physician instead of doing telemedicine and telehealth care, um, it increases risk and it, it increases transmission rates versus having people just stay in the safety of their own home. Of course, everyone can relate, especially, especially if you have students in the house around education. Um, how do they learn? How, how do they stay up to, up to speed and on track to graduate and all the other concerns that family members have if they don't have adequate connectivity within their household? This can be said not only for this particular project for Northern Corridor, but even areas right here locally in Flagstaff. There's plenty of use cases where uh, people just don't, don't have really good connections. And then most importantly is the public safety aspect. Uh, huge gaps, our, our law enforcement does a phenomenal job, our sheriff's office, Sheriff Driscoll and um, you know, Chief of Police Musselman, I mean, they do a phenomenal job, same with out in Page, but we could do better from a technology perspective to give the resources and tools um, to our public and life safety um, workforce. Um, this would cut down their turnaround times to, to an event. Um, and there's, there's just so many benefits of, around public safety. We unfortunately experienced the museum fire, and this was a, a, a very close call. Um, what you can see on the illustration on the left is uh, what's known as Devil's Head, TV Hill, and Lookout Point. And you can see on the illustration or the picture on the right, uh, there's actually a uh, um, aircraft dropping um, the retarded, the fire suppressant across the hilltop trying to protect those assets. Um, typically that they do that just as a precaution, but David told us like if the fire climbs the hill, it'll burn. And if it burns, it'll become degraded and whatever, you know, um, whatever you're serving from those microwave tires, towers would likely be impacted. We actually have aerial fiber in different areas. And of course, you know, anything that's exposed is gonna be easily burned. But the outcome of this from a public safety perspective is that from, from this location all the way north to the border of Utah, we would, we would lose um, cell phone coverage. Um, we would still have coverage here in Flagstaff, but this would certainly impact the Navajo Nation, um, Page, and other areas because they don't have backhaul outside, right? They don't have a way to transport that data. And that's really what a middle mile does is you're transporting data from point A to point B. And so of course, if this was um, approved and we had the middle mile infrastructure, we would have multiple points um, of interconnect where different providers, whether it's a microwave uh, provider like illustrated in this picture or any other um, you know, entity, they would tap into that middle mile and we would be, be basically providing transport services on their behalf. I'm gonna go ahead and refer over to economic development to uh, Chris. I think he'd like to say a few things regarding this slide, Chris. Good afternoon board and uh, county managers and deputy county managers. Uh, Chris Pastor is here, economic development. I, I wanna make one thing really clear. When we talk with rural Arizona, the silver bullet, if you will, or the golden bullet is broadband. Everybody wants it. Everybody's fighting for it. Everybody's clawing for it because really it is the, the it, it, in a lot of ways, the equalizer. It brings out of state jobs. It brings revenue. It brings opportunity to rural parts of the country that uh, won't be there without that, uh, that good connectivity. And so uh, when we, uh, we updated our uh, uh, competitive uh, economic development strategy through NACOG, broadband was number one. 
above and beyond. So really, it, I, I liken this time to uh, to back in the 1850s when everybody was racing for the transcontinental railway, right? Those major railway intersections determined which towns, which regions, which states, which territories would become of significance in the future. And that same thing is being applied now to broadband, particularly the middle mile coming across the, uh, the, the rural areas. If you can connect a rural area into that, that uh, middle mile, then you have all of a sudden have commerce and opportunity that, that wasn't there before. So what, what this do has done is it's created a highly competitive environment. Obviously, demand is exceeding the, uh, the supply, not only in people wanting internet, but also there's uh, supply constraints on fiber, on workers that can install it, on IT technicians uh, who can manage it. Uh, so, so what we're seeing is we're seeing rising costs in all of these, uh, in these areas of, uh, uh, of supply. And so the, the federal government has kind of come in and says, hey, look, we're gonna support broadband infrastructure with grants. Right. So a project like this could be kind of managed or, you know, brought forth one of two ways, either borrow money. Or in combination with some some money, go for some federal grants. Right. So these federal grants are uh, are, are happening out there. But really what they're what the grants are uh, are geared at is creating a P3 or a, a, a public private partnership. And uh, so really they wanna see local governments teaming up with private entities to bring broadband to the residents. And, and there's all different types of uh, uh, partnerships or, or P3s out there. Um, but one of the things that makes it really challenging is that governments and private entities don't really talk the same language. While we're very open about what our plans are, where we're going, what we'd like to see, uh, private industry is not that way for, for, uh, for reasons of uh, uh, sheer competition or uh, protecting their, uh, their investment from, uh, from sabotage or, uh, or, or leakage of, uh, of potential sales. So it's almost like you have one group that wants to talk about it all and the other group that's just kind of doing it and keeping it silent. And so that, that creates some challenges. But there are um, some, uh, some successful partnerships happening with our neighbors. And I wanted to share a few of them with you just to give you some context of what those uh, partnerships could look like. Uh, for, for example, the uh, uh, Mojave County uh, is really, they, they're fully supportive of a, of a privately owned fiber service. And uh, part of that is, uh, you know, they, they help them to get the funding, help this private company get the funding. Uh, they will have, uh, you know, rights to it. But in return, the uh, county is getting very, very affordable fiber for their, their, uh, their community, their uh, government buildings. So that's, that's kind of one thing, you know, that there's a private company that owns it, controls it, runs it, manages it. And the, uh, the, the uh, gov local government kind of takes a little bit of a backseat uh, and, and, and enjoy some of the benefit. Uh, you know, for example, uh, Yavapai County, um, they, they've uh, been said to uh, be investing nearly $20 million of their ARP allocation into developing their networks. So that's Yavapai County, so one of our neighbors. Um, Navajo County, um, Navajo County actually has some municipalities that are leading their, uh, their network uh, build outs. Uh, St. John's is, uh, is one of those uh, municipalities that's, uh, that's getting federal and, uh, and, and state uh, match funding uh, to add to their funding to develop their, uh, their network. So, I mean, there's all different types of P3 partnerships out there. Um, we, work, we work with all of them, we talk with all of them, but I share a few examples with you, um, just so you, you kind of know how, uh, how this is uh, unfolding in, in, uh, across Northern Arizona. But when it comes to partnering uh, with a, uh, a private partner um, or and applying for these grants, there is an expectation that the major holder of the, uh, of the uh, partnership, whether it be, if it is the county, there's an expectation that they'll have about 20% of the total projects in cost in match. So there's this expectation that, uh, that, 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 that the county uh, or municipality who's going into this project has a considerable amount of uh, capital to invest in order to attract that grant money. Now, uh, when it comes to uh, um, working for a, uh, uh, working towards attracting this grant money, uh, 
oftentimes the state wants to collaborate with entities, local entities, in order to make a, a more uh, a attractive federal uh, grant application. Now, the ACA is that entity for us. The ACA, um, we, uh, we filed a, an expression of interest, which is essentially a mini grant to say, hey, ACA, let us partner with you to apply for some federal funding uh, through the uh, NTIA. So that's the uh, National Telecommunications Infrastructure Administration. It's federal money. And uh, so the ACA received about 30 of these expressions of interest, uh, and they, uh, they made some decisions. Unfortunately, we weren't uh, in, in, their, uh, in their yes category because there was other counties and other municipalities who had more match or they, they were able to serve more, uh, more customers or more residents uh, with, with broadband. But there's still many other uh, federal and state uh, funding opportunities out there. But really what it comes down to and, and in summary, uh, there's kind of three things. One is it, it's really about a private public partnership that is essential. Um, and then also we're talking big dollars, you know, 20% uh, is the expected match. Uh, and then uh, number three is, is competition is very strong. Thus, you know, kind of coming back to the importance of a good partnership and the importance of having uh, big dollars to go into, uh, into that, that partnership. So I'm going to pause there and uh, turn it back to Matt Fowler. I just wanted to bring some context of what's happening out there in the federal funding world, what our partners are doing, and how to navigate through those, uh, those challenges. Yeah, thank you, Chris. And just to clarify, um, in regards to the match, it's, it's up to, it's not always where you have to do 20 in some cases, like with EDA, um, you know, they'll do, they'll do a forgiveness, like where the, the municipality doesn't have to come in with the match or with ACA, they might do 10% versus 20, but absolutely a great point to bring to the board's attention because, you know, if we're going down this road and we have to come up with a 20% match, it's certainly something that needs to be discussed early versus later. Um, and then also just around economic development, with the unfortunate closure um, within Coconino County around the coal plant, I mean, there's there's major um, impacts, right, to our communities from an economic development perspective that this middle mile absolutely would improve the quality of their lives and uh, employment and, and so many positive outcomes. So thank you, Chris, for, for jumping in and I'll go ahead and move on to slide 14. Uh, so again, back in November, why now? Um, you could see here at the U.S. Treasury, we we're talking billions of dollars. Uh, today's trillions. Um, if we look at why now today, it's absolutely um, tons and tons of money that's being uh, funneled in, uh, infrastructure bills. Um, and so we're in a really, really good position and, uh, you know, working with federal and state partners. And uh, the reason why now is, is obvious because of the pandemic, even though such a horrible situation, hopefully we see some positive cash flow that helps organizations like us help out our communities to get them connected. And next steps again from 2020 was, you know, taking a look at applying, collaborating with community partners and developing, you know, a better understanding of, um, of this project, developing a broadband strategic team, um, further communicating with our board and just really, you know, tackling this to the best of our ability on top of everything else that was going on. Uh, we created like a basic FAQ and, you know, common questions for our board and, you know, try to get ahead of any questions they thought they might have. I'll go ahead and just read a couple here. Is this project considered competing with the private sector? Uh, second question is what happens if Coconino County does not get involved? What happens if a long haul provider installs fiber across the region? Will we benefit? And how much does it cost to operate and maintain the middle mile? Um, I'm not going to read all the answers for the sake of time, but, you know, please take a look at your, your slide packet. And, um, you know, reach out to Helen and Chris or I if you have any further questions. But ultimately, our board said the one thing we're not going to do is not get involved. You know, Matt, Helen, team, we, please pursue, swing the bat, take this as far as you can take it. Um, we have to get involved as, as a government and, and, and then have those further conversations and dialogue and present to the board on what those opportunities look like. So options A, B, and C, um, seeking board recommendation again in 2020 is for us to pursue and possibly um, you know, build and operate the middle mile independently, just completely owned by Coconino County, or option B, um, you know, pursue middle mile, but look at some collaboration opportunities. You know, who else wants to possibly be a partner? Or C, not to do anything. And again, the board 
um, asked us to heavily get involved and just take this as far as we could. And, and so we did. Um, on slide 17 here, this is the last slide of the board presentation back in November of 2020. And this is the start of the remainder of the presentation um, for today. Uh, so when we take a look at the project today, we're almost to a couple slides. So we're going to go into some Q&A and wrap this up. Um, but looking at project to date, community outreach, we've had over 100 meetings. Um, Helen and I were kind of stumbled, you know, how many meetings we've actually had, how many presentations, how much great dialogue we've had with, um, you know, the state, with the governor's office, with Jeff Sabatka, Arizona Commerce Authority, NACOG. I mean, there's so many um, conversations, um, you know, further promoting this particular initiative. And again, developing the website, um, attending workshops, presentations, seminars, and then doing a lot of research. Really, this is Chris's area. He's excellent at researching USDA, EDA, ACA, FCC, and uh, NTIA. And there's a ton more. There's so many different funding opportunities in the event that we were to be selected for an award. So uh, great work, Chris. And then stakeholder outreach. We decided just to throw together some logos. Um, again, we've worked with and spoke to so many different entities from ADOT, Econa, uh, Magellan Advisor, Zona Wired actually showed an interest, um, USDA, the state's office, um, ALO, Praxis. Um, we recently spoke with uh, Senator Mark Kelly's office, I think the last week or week before. Uh, we've spoken with FEMA, uh, ATNI, Flagstaff Unified School District joined our broadband team and wrote letters of support. Um, Steve Burrell with Northern, Ari Northern Arizona University, excuse me, also on our broadband team and has letters of support from previous uh, President Rita Chang. We've worked closely with Metro Plan, uh, Greater Flagstaff. We did presentations for the city of Page. Uh, thank you, Helen. And we've, we've also you know, reached out to a lot of last mile providers like South Central Communications, um, you know, NTUA, Choice Wireless and others, really just to educate, this is what we're trying to do in addition to Arcadia and Infracom. Uh, Geoverse uh, as well. And we just have a long, long list. Um, I'm going to show briefly the, the county website that we stood up. You guys should be able to see my screen fine. And so this is the site, talks about the opportunity, talks about the project, talks about the node design and what those nodes look like, those prefab buildings that would be um, erected at each one of those locations, talks about our, our data driven benefits and our challenges, which is right of way in addition to project funding, uh, all the letters of support that we've received from Econa, NAU, City of Flagstaff, uh, Metro Plan, and, and so many more. And then the broadband team that we created, which consists of myself, Helen, Derek Massif from the Sun Corridor Network, Steve Burrell at NAU, CJ Perry, City of Flagstaff, PJ Way, NAU, Mary Knight, who was phenomenal, who just recently retired from FUSD, Kane Scott from the City of Page, uh, Chris, uh, Coconino County, and of course, our public affairs team, um, Alex Fisher. So a lot of work um, has gone into this initiative. And right now, we're going to pause and go into a staff recommendation on the next steps, which is us formally pursuing right of way um, in order to make this work. And so there's various landowners along this uh, route of Highway 89. And so we're, we're seeking um, the, the board's approval and, and we're making the staff recommendation to you to submit for SF-299 applications to the different federal and state agencies. Uh, the really big one here is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, we, we absolutely need to get right of way in order to um, build and um, implement the, this middle mile across the reservation. In the event that we are unable to obtain right of way, we need to Regain plan. You know, do we want to run the fiber to our county jurisdiction and stop? Do we not want to pursue it at all? Do we want to look at other areas across Coconino County? Certainly a topic for board um, consideration into the future. And of course, the Forest Service, the Park Service, Bureau of Land Management. Um, we have really great relationships with uh, Brad Burgess at ADOT. And um, we're, we're, we're really hopeful and optimistic that we'll see approvals across the board. The only wild card here is, you know, to date we've had a lot of a lot of sideline conversation, a lot of presentations, um, not specifically with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, but with the Navajo Nation. And we were always told that it's highly encouraged and they would want to write letters of support or letters of commitment or possibly look at right of way. And we haven't really had anything tangible to bring back to the board for your consideration. So we're taking a different approach 
and going through a formal process where our boards, our boards of supervisor signatures, county manager signatures, and mine or whoever's is necessary to go on the applications. And then let's see what their legal response is. Um, and then we can negotiate if needed and bring that to your attention for further discussion and consideration. Um, and so we can continue. I think I'll refer to Chair Ryan. Do you want me to go ahead and just do the last two slides for SpaceX or would you like me to pause uh, and allow a response for the staff recommendation, Chair Ryan? Uh, yeah, good question. Um, well, we, you know, we're on the broadband piece uh, associated with it. Um, Steve, uh, pause for a second. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, this would probably be a good time to do questions yeah. on the broadband and then we yep. can proceed from there. Okay. Okay. Board members, <laughs> questions or comments uh, associated with it? First, I just want to say thank you for the presentation. It got me caught up to speed. Um, I really appreciated seeing the little uh, the rectangles of the different spaces for the project and, and seeing how the different phases uh, broke out. So I'm looking forward to seeing how we can help uh, provide some of these services to our community. Definitely see the value in it based on the information about economic development with the digital economy. So look forward to uh, seeing how we can put this into place. Uh, I can go ahead and hop on it uh, for a minute here. Um, and we did, you know, when we uh, uh, took a look at it, it uh, we knew stepping into this, uh, we needed to pursue it. It seemed like a, a, a really good idea um, of looking at infrastructure where we're lacking infrastructure uh, we know we need it in other areas, uh, but uh, taking a look at this piece, uh, it fit well uh, with um, other government agencies, a possibility of potentially hooking up to uh, uh, the, uh, another state uh, area of need, obviously, within the county uh, that you have associated with it. Uh, it, it shouldn't be um, only this but by the same token, we need to focus uh, and look at, you know, how can we initiate this for coverage? Uh, and, and with that, with the uh, uh, expansion of uh, broadband, um, you know, obviously, if you look at current day and technology, uh, which these guys could explain a heck of a lot better than I, uh, but we all see it, um, you know, we'll be left in the dark if we don't step into um, enhancing or pursuing or having those others help us pursue uh, the opportunity for enhancements of uh, broadband within our region. Uh, the drawback historically is Matt had a single aligner, but we got into a lot more of a discussion was we all waited around for it. Somebody else do it, somebody else do it. Uh, fortunately, uh, the, the piece that was missing that looks like is definitely coming forward is the uh, uh, federal and state investments. Uh, when we initiated this process, we saw the possibility that the state might do it. We had no idea whether the feds would be stepping in with the infra infrastructure funding. Uh, and that's the key piece. How do you get the middle mile? Who's gonna really pay for that? Uh, uh, that? That is a big piece associated with it. So, um, you know, definitely an area of uh, worth investment the, the pieces that are not outlined there because this is a project that we focused on specifically, knowing that the state was focusing on I-17 and I-40, uh, but that middle mile has got to be connected uh, also. And so uh, we brought up a discussion with City of Flagstaff, hey, you know, we need to push for connectivity between uh, 89 and I-17, there is a gap in the city itself. So that's another element uh, related to that. But uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the staff recommendations, well, you have other ones later on. So I'm not gonna get ahead of you. I'll, I'll wait with that. Um, other questions? Uh, go ahead, Patrice. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and thank you for this uh, presentation and uh, uh, I know that this is a very important topic for all of us here in Northern Arizona. And um, 
you know, obviously uh, broadband and the need for broadband is needed all across all of rural uh, Coconino County. I, I know the governor through ADOT had $50 million set aside for certain projects along um, I-17 uh, from Sunset Point to Flag. And then we've got, um, you know, I-40 from Arizona to New Mexico. Um, I know the Navajo Nation has, has taken a look at broadband and has received uh, $286 million and probably more coming with the infrastructure bill. Um, and I guess it's huge. And it really means that we need to do what we can to maximize our partnerships. Coconino County can't do it alone. I think we need to be a partner. I think we need to be an active partner. I think we owe that to our community. I think we owe that to those who live in, in the rural parts of Coconino County. So I am very much in favor of um, proceeding with broadband, looking for our partners uh, and seeing how we can proceed with the technology together uh, and which seems to be fiber optics, uh, which uh, at least at this point, who knows what the future is gonna bring. Uh, and I um, know that in November, I sat in on a board meeting in November, 2020, um, where the board did authorize to support grant opportunities. I'm not sure if anything was ever really successful with those grant opportunities. Um, I, I, I think also that we do need to look at getting these rights of way um, because that's going to determine where, when, and how we're able to do this. Uh, I, and I guess one question I would ask um, uh, and, and by the way, the rights of way is kind of the beginning steps. So there's a lot of conversation between the rights of ways and how we proceed. Uh, and that may kind of direct how we do proceed, who are our partners and, and et cetera. But if we would right now say, yeah, let's start taking a look at these rights of ways. Is there a cost associated with that, Matt or, or Helen? Um, or is this something that's just other than obviously administrative costs, which is expensive, uh, because I know that it's going, I've worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and I've worked with the National Park Service and I've worked with the BLM and they are not easy to work with. So, uh, and it takes time. So is there a cost associated? I mean, I see no downside with proceeding with rights of way. Uh, Chair Ryan, uh, Supervisor Horseman. So I'll have to get back with you on the total costs for each of the entities, you know, for the applications. But we are working with Praxis Associates that's very, very distinguished in this process. They do this all the time. And so we're, we're in, an, in, an, in an agreement with them today um, for $7,500 within the IT budget, uh, not requiring board approval, for them to handle all that on our behalf and schedule all the necessary meetings with each of these entities. And then once we have um, either approvals or no approvals, we plan to come back and share that information with our board so we can together determine next steps. Do we wanna look at other areas in Arizona? Do we wanna stop entirely? Um, do we wanna take it just up to 89 and have the demarcation point be at the boundary of Coquino County and the boundary of Navajo Nation if we're not allowed right of way? And what benefit does that add to the community? Really, it would be benefiting Doney, right? Doney Park and all the constituents along that route. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one could argue maybe we should be investing in some other areas. Um, it's really up to the board to have really good dialogue because there's so many areas, to your point, across Arizona that are in very similar positions. So we'll have to come back with you with more data. Thank you, Matt. And by the way, I think, it, you know, bringing that information, what's it going to cost us? I, I really am very much bullish in Coconino County, getting involved in providing broadband services to the rural parts of our county. Um, I know the middle mile has been something the board has looked at way before some of us got on the board. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I'm, I am supportive of it. Um, it's just a matter of how do we proceed? Who can be our partners? What is the cost? Um, but I see no downside in proceeding once we get a breakdown of a cost, I don't see any downsiding, downside in proceeding with rights away. I think it's a good thing to do, to try to get this off the dive and to move this forward. And you know, with money, hopefully that will be coming with infrastructure bill,
that will receive county that the city will receive some and that the Navajo Nation will receive, you know, it's possible that that's the kind of uh, that, that that's, you know, the kind of thing that we need to create the partnership to really get this broadband services to northern Arizona done. So um, if it's not a huge expense, I'm all for getting trying to get these rights of ways. And that's going to really that's going to be a roadmap of what we can do or what we can't do. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, thanks. And, and I in terms of options, I really like uh, option B, um, if, if you're asking us. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's what I was pausing on. I, I thought, oh, he did cover it. I, I thought we didn't cover that. I'm so, yeah. option B, too. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so th thank you very much. And thank you for, you know, your, your, your input. Thank you for thinking outside the box. Uh, thank you for working so hard on behalf of the rural parts of our community. Um, I do think that you know, we owe it to our rural parts of Coconino County to get broadband access to them. So thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, Chair Ryan, uh, Supervisor Horseman, thank you. I just also wanna make the comment that it's not necessarily required to have right of way prior to applying for a grant, but because of the competitive market uh, to Chris's point earlier is that, you know, let's just say Arizona Commerce Authority, for example, if they have 75 million to 100 million dollars to invest, which they're, they're going to come October, November, they want to make sure that it's a viable deal, right? They don't want to invest or give a certain entity X amount of money and then find out later that they don't have all their, their pieces and ducks in a row. And then now that money is not being used as they intended it to be. And it just creates a lot of confusion. So that's why we're being proactive to have these not difficult conversations, but understanding where we sit. Um, is this gonna be a challenge? Are we gonna to have to overcome um, an obstacle or are we gonna just be granted right of way? And then we know. Um, and of course we can you know, bring that back. Arizona Commerce Authority has referred numerous, numerous municipalities to Coconino County based off of the work that um, Helen and Chris and I have done to date and really are with our board's uh, input. And so they're really highlighting, especially our website and the outreach and really painting the picture visually to bring it all together. But again, all of this means nothing if we can't obtain right of way. Exactly. So we're going we're gonna to pursue heavily. We're going to continue to swing the bat. And anything that's going to be um, of a high expense, we're always communicating with Deputy um, County Manager Brown. And if there was something that required um, board awareness from a cost per perspective, I'm certain she would call you. Can I, one more question and then and then uh, chair I, I will be through but um, I understand that, for example, Grand Canyon National Park is looking at broadband ex extending broadband access, and I know they've talked to the folks in Tuzian about that Matt have you talked with them and know what they're up to. Yes, uh, Supervisor Horseman absolutely so we got our latest update yesterday from AT and I um, from john champagne and they're actually running fiber from an e rate program from um, Interstate 40 up through uh, 64, and that's gonna go all the way to the Grand Canyon schools. At the same time, they're working to see if they could you know, um, connect a lot of the hotels and different businesses and looking at helping out um, the new town manager there in Valley and Tucson. I've forgotten her name, but uh, really great partnerships and a positive dialogue. And there's fiber you know, being deployed. It's not the same as ours with the abundance of fiber, but certainly enough fiber to really add a community benefit. Absolutely. Is there is there a possibility we can eventually tie into that? I think it would require negotiations. Um, typically, E-rate is a um, school funded right. initiative and typically you can't tap in and um, have the commingling of funding. Mm -hmm. But I think with the way the world is you know, reacting with COVID and all of the different opportunities, I think in some areas we might see some exceptions to where we could possibly leverage that. But I, would, I wouldn't answer that 100% yes today, but I know that E-rate around the rules and restrictions of how that fiber is to be used. I know there's conversations on, you know, allowing municipalities or other state agencies opportunities because in the end we're all providing community and public service. It's not for private gain, but that hasn't been official, but those are things that are in the work. So I, I, I feel very optimistic, but I'd have to come back to you once I have a confirmation to answer you properly. Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you for all your efforts on this. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, 
I want to hop on this one just for a second, uh, just in terms of conversation. I mean, part of Steve's question, what are we doing and how are we looking at this? It does beg the question of where our conversations are with the state associated with what they're doing on I-17 and I-40 for the node opportunities, you know, other areas in the county that uh, we know are happening. Uh, are we in those conversations or not? And uh, if not, you know, I would suggest that we should be in those conversations, uh, you know, as we're looking, we want to, we want to see this. Uh, I, I love what we have presented here. Uh, I fully support it as I have in the past. Uh, you've developed it much more so. Here's your next recommendation for right away. I think it makes sense. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the suggestion of A, B, or C, you know, obviously collaboration with others, we can't pay for it all. Um, what are the opportunities, especially that federal money, if we can tap that federal money and use it, you know, that, that's a key. The more we broaden our opportunities in the county, great, not to the point of compromising the project, uh, but, but enhancing uh, our opportunities uh, would be my suggestion. Uh, let's see, we've heard from, we haven't heard from Supervisor Begay. Uh, Judy? Are you out there, Supervisor Begay? Okay. Hello. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> oh, question now. Um, um, I, I, I'm looking at this here, and a lot of work was put into it. Uh, an excellent presentation that was is uh, that's done, that's being done, and updates. You know, I'm really happy with um, information that's being given to us. I know um, they're they're um, at, you know, the staff are asking um, what options, um, or they're, they're they're asking for recommendations. I think B would be the best one, um, looking considering A, B, and C, only because um, if you don't involve people um, as a, a sense of ownership, if they feel that there's an ownership and they're gonna go the whole nine, nine yards. And so and that's one. And then also in all these, um, um, part all these um, application for federal state agencies, BIA, US Forest Service, National Park Service, BLM and Arizona um, ADOT. I know they have hobby guts have had, had funding given to them that's just sitting there that you know they're trying to. And normally when uh, you get funded, you don't get uh, you just get partial like you know of the need that 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 needs to be used for for um, um, in this case broadband. So I'm just sitting here thinking you know um, I think we just need to include everyone that's on there. And I, I would like to see way over beyond this one of these days, you know, a phase three opportunity, you know, like um, uh, a nearby places like in all the districts uh, where there are a lot of people, you know, that need the, these services. And um, so that, you know, we're, we're catching most of the people that are out there, out, uh, out there that need broadband services. So, um, and you are right for E-rate, you know, there's um, school, school, school funded um, um, internet services. And so, you know, only if we meet and we meet with people and um, get their um, input and stuff like that, will you know that you're not, you know, double dipping or, you know, you can't be uh, over uh, using funds that we're not supposed to be used. And so um, it could be too much if we were to take it independently and, um, and then try to um, run it as a county. So, um, but option C, um, that's out of the question. Uh, I think it's really needed. The communities out there are looking up to us and they want to see, um, you know, what, what, can, what can be done. And um, as, as you know, broadband in the rural communities is really, really needed. We have a lot of uh, things that are happening out there. And, so the opportunity, you know, would be there for, for, for everyone um, that that's, that is going to serve us. So uh, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Uh, Chair Ryan, Supervisor Begay, thank you for your input. And uh, we're certainly always trying to be creative as possible and look for improving the lives, you know, for so many people in, in, in all areas. 
Um, we unfortunately can only do bits and pieces at a time, but we certainly appreciate the feedback. And the more that our board wants to expand this, um, you know, this initiative, we're more than happy to, to fill the role and do as much as we can. So thank you. So what I want to do here, though, is let me walk through the board members on the uh, request that we have here. Uh, so um, uh, in terms of um, uh, per, to formally uh, pursue right away, are you, uh, uh, Patrice, I think you said you are okay, but you're not in your head yes uh, on that. Uh, and then I'll go to uh, Hieronima, Supervisor Vasquez, are you okay with that? Yes, I am. Okay. And then Supervisor Begay, are you okay with that? Yes. And uh, Supervisor Fowler? Yes, I am. And I'd like to say a few words. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you started out, but I didn't bring you back to this conversation. I'm sorry about that. And, and Chair, Chair Ryan, if I make it very clear, yes, but I'd like to know the cost. I mean, if the cost is... Yeah. You know, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I'm not. I think that's money well spent. If we're talking about two or three hundred thousand, it needs to come back to us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, this needs to be brought back to us. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I should have thrown that in. Uh, I, I, I would agree. I mean, we don't want to uh, expose us to points that we can't support. Um, uh, Vice Chair Fowler, Lena. Yes, thank you, um, and thank you. Um, to our board of supervisors for the support. And this is just something that, I mean, how can we not support it? All of our communities need this. Uh, and like, um, super, I mean, you supervisor, Matt, uh, like, like director, um, Matt just, uh, Fowler just said, you know, we've been working and meeting with all partners and all fronts um, and just, just really trying to get the support. So we've met with Navajo Nation, uh, what it looks like we're about to, with these meetings, there's different groups too. There's task force, there's um, there's council, um, council, and there's different groups that we have to meet. Just met with the Hopi chairman, but they're going through a re-election campaign right now, or elections is happening. So there's there's life that's happening at the same time and um and and we're not just looking at this we met with ntua we asked them to put up a big dish up on the cut on the way to page to aim towards the um lee's ferry and bitter springs and the um, marble canyon and grand canyon area jacob lake so it's there is a lot of partnership taking place and we are, um, we're gonna continue doing this. We have um, several meetings that are taking place and just the pandemic, as you all know, put a halt to a lot of this. But um, the Arizona task force, I know Matt and Helen and others are, are involved in that, um, as well as um, the other broadband initiatives. And so we are pretty much, um, you know, uh, looking at different ways and you're gonna hear about the Starlink here soon. And that's another area. So looking at the microwave, we have the Tuba City network, um, broadband network that we've used. So um, there are different ways that we're really looking at this. And we know it's a huge priority for our, our citizens and um, for the board. So I just wanna thank um, the endless energy that our staff have and the creativity that they bring to the table and trying to address the needs in our, in our county. So thank you. Uh, Chair Ryan, Supervisor Fowler, thanks for the feedback and thank you for always being uh, supportive with the, the Rural Broadband Initiative. You've introduced us to so many great people on the nation and uh, beyond. And so thank you for the partnership and for always advocating um, on this very critical topic. I also want to make a quick com comment to Chair Ryan. I didn't have a chance to respond earlier about the I-40 and the I-17. Um, so just so you're just so you're aware that we are regularly meeting with Governor Ducey's office and Ben Blink, talking with the Sun Corridor Network, who's um, helping out with that initiative um, from you know construction perspective. 
And we also meet with um, various stakeholders right here in our backyard and our community, talking about ways to improve and interconnect City of Flag staff as well. And so that's an ongoing conversation. We're heavily involved on in knowing what's happening. It's just difficult to know when it's not a public entity of what's really happening if it's private. Um, we hear lots of rumors, there's lots of dialogue, but we're creating um, and forming really good long-term relationships where we do now have better insight of where fiber is being built. But to Chris's point earlier, it's something they keep very close to their chest because it's a very competitive market in the private industry. And plus, if they knew where you know, uh, a um, central office or a major hub was located, somebody could go there and sabotage it and then their, their, their customers would be impacted. So typically like utility and all this information is always very secretive. It would be great if in the future we had some type of an ordinance and it's a little bit off topic and I apologize for bringing it up, but it would be great to have some type of an ordinance that required um, Infracom companies to provide us where their fiber routes are located, not for us to share publicly, but to share with our board. So we had a better understanding of where those gaps um, originate and how to fill those gaps if we have a better understanding of what fiber and availability within certain districts um, across our county. Because typically we, we could request that information, but they will never provide it. Um, so that's, that's and, something I wanted to mention. And, and, and early on, naive as I am, that's what I did. I asked uh, where are all the broadband providers, internet providers, and let's come together, have a meeting, and let's reveal where are these, um, their, their systems are laid. And I learned that that does not happen. So I learned of, I've learned so much from Matt and his team, just how, how the, um, the industry works. So uh, right now, though, uh, I think it's, we're in a comfortable place where we are just moving forward. Thank you so much, board and chair. Yeah, and I, I, I would say, you know, to that, and I think we've heard it, you know, strung together a little bit in the conversation, uh, you know, this is a good focus area. Knowing what's going on throughout the county uh, gives us a little bit better picture. Obviously, you can report off it. Uh, the idea of an ordinance and or the information uh, of what those pieces are, of what we do have access to, uh, helps us, uh, you know, how are we looking at the broader county? What's going on with uh, broadband? Uh, how do we build upon what you're already working on? With these other pieces, uh, where can we? Uh, when is the private sector doing it? Uh, you know that would be helpful, and that could also lead to an ordinance potentially um, for that. Um, you know, and if, you know, providing. Excuse me for not, you know, speaking up uh, on your behalf, uh, Vice Chair, but I think it was important for other board members to weigh in. Uh, but I do want to compliment you on your leadership on, on what you have been doing. And, and working together uh, and reaching out to these other entities. It's been very helpful uh, for what Matt's doing. So I'm um, just, before we move on, Steve, Sue, Matt, are you good with where we are with broadband? We're gonna go to Bay, uh, SpaceX next. That's, we're good, sir. Okay. Okay, sir, thank you. All right, Charlie, okay. we're gonna go ahead and move forward in the event we come across anything exceeding that dollar threshold, we'll bring it back to the board and bring it to your attention as uh, mentioned earlier. So moving on to SpaceX, uh, Starlink update. Again, this is um, considered LEO, uh, low earth orbit satellites. Uh, here's a picture actually from Supervisor Fowler that she texted me in the late hours of the night. So excited to see um, all the satellites that were recently launched and, and deployed. And you know, you'll see these um, for a short period as they're ascending into low earth orbit. And so eventually they get up to uh, 550 kilometers and you can't see it by the eye, about 340 miles. Um, but on their journey too, you'll see these long pattern uh, lines, which are satellites and there's 60 typically per launch. Um, and that's what you see on the picture here. So great picture, Supervisor Fowler. And thanks for sharing. I know we had a lot of citizens that were curious, what is that in the night sky? And had a lot of people talking. So uh, this has been extremely successful. Um, we've heard nothing but positive feedback. The, the citizens that were selected as part of this beta process in Matuba City uh, um, extremely improved the quality of their lives, um, both from a student teacher perspective around telemedicine, education, and it's been nothing but positive and kudos and appreciation 
some are very emotional um, with their appreciation that it's really catapulted them into the next um, century and, and doing things that they typically hadn't been able to do or accomplish before. And so we're very, very excited, um, you know, to, to see the positive outcomes of the, of the county's investment in this area. Um, comments or questions regarding SpaceX? Um, I can talk a little bit technical if needed, but we'll allow opportunity for feedback. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and I'm not sure, is this the report or is it just an update? And uh, otherwise I'll wait to the end, but you know, my, my, oh, it is, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Questions, yeah. comments, okay. Um, you know, I, I think that as we talked about before, I think, uh, you know, Coconino County made the investment. We showed that this was a technology that could work and uh, that would enrich uh, folks' lives that were in places that were difficult to provide the fiber optic um, uh, uh, connections, if you will, for, for broadband. My main concern, I, I gotta tell you, we'll find out is, is uh, moving forward, is um, going to be at the end of the year when our commitment uh, in terms of providing the upfront money for the equipment and getting it set up and providing the internet provision or uh, for uh, internet cost on a monthly basis, after the year is up, how many of these individuals will carry that service forward? I mean, I think to me, that's gonna be the indication of how successful we were. I mean, I think we were able to provide internet services for a year at, at considerable cost, but it will be a considerable benefit if they're able to continue that um, internet going forward. So um, I know it's exciting technology and I, I think we've premiered what can be done and I'm hoping people like NAU or CCC or uh, other uh, organizations uh, or educational institutions, you know, may kind of pick this up, but um, we, we were there, we were the first, we were the beta, <laughs> we were the test. So uh, again, thanks for that. And I look forward to hear an update at the end of the year too on, on how many people were able to stay on the internet connection. So thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll throw in a, a few pieces here and you know, make sure we get everybody in one. Um, you know, fair question on that. You know, it, it begs the question of, uh, you know, underserved, can they continue it? Uh, and, and uh, uh, if not, what is the barrier associated with it? In the meantime, though, uh, you know, I saw this when we were stepping into it and, and uh, uh, making the decision on whether to invest or not is uh, creating um, the pilot opportunity, which became the seed, which could lead to uh, broader access uh, throughout the county, throughout the region. I think that is proving up from uh, what I've been hearing and seeing, and I'd love to, you know, see the more information uh, if it is possible. Of course, we're dealing with private sector here too. So uh, do we have access to the information? Uh, hopefully, uh, um, but I'm, I'm well aware of a lot of people in the uh, uh, parks in Williams area, as they found out about it, uh, they were opening, opening up the opportunity uh, for them to access it. Uh, and I think, you know, a market has been found for rural users uh, that were challenged if they didn't have it, if they had, you know, questionable service, uh, they are accessing it. So uh, from what I'm hearing, it sounds great, you know, to see more information on it would be uh, helpful uh, on that. So uh, let's go uh, other board members on this. And I'll go ahead and roll through it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, we'll conclude with Supervisor Fowler uh, probably on this one. But let me go to uh, uh, Supervisor Begay. You've got a lot of rural areas. Do you have any comments on SpaceX? I know it takes a minute for you to get to your mute button. Not seeing you coming up. I'll go to Supervisor Baskins.
Yeah, out there, supervisor. Sure. <laughs> there you go. That. No, I'm really excited about this uh, this uh, ability to link more communities and families with the rural areas. So I look forward to seeing how we can continue to provide those services for our communities and partner with uh, the school districts and different entities so that we can provide these services to our, to our community. All right. And then uh, try Supervisor Begay one more time. I'm on the phone. Oh, there you are. I'm there here. You. Okay, <laughs> did you want to comment on SpaceX? Uh, just basically, you know, move forward with it, and you know, I'm 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 in support of it, and um, it's needed, and you know, we just need to move forward with it. And um, um, somewhere along the way, something needs to be changed, and it's got to be changed a little, you know. But otherwise, you know, I'll probably just run with it and see how how far it gets. As I know the right of ways um will probably be an issue, but otherwise, I I see it as an opportunity for all our constituents and their families. Thank you. And then Supervisor Powell, Vice Chair. Yes, this is, um, this is, I am actually amazed how fast we were able to bring space, um, SpaceX Starlink here. Um, you know, Matt mentioned, mentioned in that, and he did a presentation and at the Colorado Plateau Economic Development Meeting and and we kind of like it was like far into the future maybe 50 years from now but here it is um and it just so happened to, to be able to meet them and bring ask them to come and uh work with us and now we have an angel account and we're able to provide services and our citizens throughout the county can actually register online and be able to sign up when the coverage is ready in their area, they'll be able to receive this um, Starlink. The, the feedback from the users, from our the citizens that have it right now, it's just really life-changing. Fast internet, no interruption. Well, there's a little hiccup and they're trying to fix that. And we learned that these um, satellites are about the size of a bus. And that's why you can see them when they're uh, launched. And it's just um, really exciting times that we're in. And you know, our county with uh, Matt and Helen just working on this, just uh, we are in the lead when it comes to uh, broadband and internet connection for our communities. It's just amazing that we have staff that, have, that are visionary and that they, they really get the work done. And so we're able to work um, on behalf of our citizens and be able to work uh, really beyond our counties right now. And we'll be able to probably provide more updates later on. So thank you so much. Thank you to our board and county manager uh, and all those that are involved. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you, Vice Chair. And again, on your leadership here, uh, I remember when it, coming back from a conference, oh, oh, uh, you're all excited about it. Uh, now be careful, we don't want to send Supervisor Fowler or Vice Chair Fowler to conference and she brings back six ideas each time. I think we all do, don't we, <laughs> on that. Um, Actually, uh, at this point, I think you, you, we have everything we needed on this particular presentation. Anything else, Steve? No, sir, we're good. Okay, so we're a little behind, but uh, uh, we knocked off uh, the tail end of our uh, yep. uh, meeting, which is good. Um, Mr. Chair, if I could yeah. comment very quickly. If I could ask you to reorder the agenda, I'd like to see if Kim Musselman can go next to do a COVID update because her schedule is crazy right now. So. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll follow with our after her presentation, but she does want to give a COVID update. Okay, fantastic. All right, Steve. Uh, and so we're, we're uh, looking at a reorg on, uh, uh, we're going to item 50 instead of 49. Uh, and that is the COVID, Steve. And yep. then Kim. So, uh, Madam, Mr. Chair, uh, Kim Osselman, HHS Director here, do you have our weekly and uh, quickly evolving daily COVID report? So. If I could uh, get your permission, we'll go ahead and go with Kim. 
we're good to go. Go ahead, Kim. All right. Good afternoon, Chair Ryan, supervisors. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here this afternoon. And yes, to uh, echo what Steve just said, definitely every day uh, our response and related to the pandemic uh, changes uh, regularly. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and jump right in uh, to have a handful of things to update you on, and then also want to make sure that you have time to ask questions and for me to follow up on some things. So with that, we'll start off uh, where we usually do, which is our numbers. And just wanted to um, begin here. This is again off of our weekly report um, for this week ending, uh, for the past week ending on August 14th, and you can see our numbers continuing uh, to go up from when they started increasing back in July. And we are, our incident rate is at the high mark at 224.8 per 100,000. And our percent positivity is substantial at 9.8%. As you'll remember, the transmission level is only in, is indicative of whichever is highest, one item being high. So therefore we are in the high transmission rate. And then our COVID-like illness, which we still continue to track on our weekly report with our um, hospitals in Coconino County reporting. And it is, at the time of this report, it was at 5.4%. And I'll talk a little bit later about the current state of the hospitals um, as that situation has been rapidly changing this week. Our vaccination rates, again, we continue to just be hovering there around that 57, 56.4, 57% for total vaccination rate. Um, we continue to be chipping away at that. But as you know, it is um, not um, going up at a substantial rate. Next slide, please. This just give you a quick forward glance to what will be our week ending August um, 21st, uh, as of last night when this report was created, we were slightly down. We'll see where that ends as we close out the week because you all are aware that things have a little bit of delay in reporting, but hopefully that will um, stay below our high point and maybe we can start moving in a different uh, direction that we would like to see with those numbers decreasing. Our testing continues to increase. In terms of numbers, you'll see there, there was 4,057 4, tests conducted throughout the week ending 814. That is, and then you see that corresponding 9.8% uh, positivity rate. Um, I did want to, while we're on this slide, just speak to you briefly about the testing uh, that's currently being offered um, at the field house of the contract with ADHS and uh, ASU Biodesign has been extended through the end of October. The Fieldhouse and NAU have expanded, worked together with ASU to expand testing hours as well. So they are doing those testing um, at the Fieldhouse six days a week. And now it is from nine to four. And actually you can go to the next slide, please, Erica. That Fieldhouse testing is from nine to four, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. I know we've had some inquiry from community members regarding additional drive-through testing options. Uh, again, I wanna point out that there are many, many places where people can get tested. Um, certainly there are private providers around Coconino County who are providing testing. Typically they are not charging for that testing other than billing insurance. If if individuals have insurance, some of the walk-in clinics and such are charging office visits. Some of this is about convenience for folks. We are working with Embry Health. They have reached out. They Embry Health has actually had a drive-through testing available up in Page for several months at one of the church uh, parking lots and church buildings. And I believe they're continuing up there along, of course, with Canyonlands doing their testing and at the uh, urgent care there. But we're also working with Embry Health. They had had a couple of locations here in Flagstaff. They are relocating and, and working with us to look for a potential other option. And again, this would be free to the individual. They will bill insurance. They actually offer several different types of testing. 
some of those outside of PCR testing do require um, costs such as rapid tests or other things. But we are, we'll get more information out once that becomes um, formalized. And we also have had some inquiry regarding testing for young children. Uh, obviously, children under the age of five typically are not able to do the saliva-based testing because uh, that's a little complicated uh, to get our young, the young toddlers to understand how you, you know, spit into a tube and to get it to a particular line. So those individuals are needing uh, PCR or nasal <laughs> type of tests. And so with that, um, I just wanted to point this out. North Country has been providing a COVID testing Monday through Friday between noon and 2 p.m. They, it's a drive up operation. Um, they do um, want you to schedule the test. And so we have put the link on here. We're going to be bringing some of this information a little more forward on our website. It is accessible on North Country's website where they can request an appointment online um, to be able to get a young person or other or anyone for that matter tested. And then Flagstaff Pediatric Care is also offering testing for children. And we've got the um, online link there and also the phone number. And again, we're going to be doing some looking at our website. Um, lots of the information had been going through, which was the statewide testing information. And we're just noticing that it is not being kept as current and up to date with all the providers um, being able to be accessed there. And so I think we're going to um, take a few things into our own hands in terms of at least putting some of our local providers just on our web page as another way uh, for people to access uh, that information. Um, the other piece uh, that I wanted to um, touch on uh, with respect, I think, I think I've covered everything on testing. Can we go to the next slide, please? Next, I want to move into vaccine information and talk not only about uh, the FDA approval of Pfizer, which is incredibly exciting uh, in our world. Um, hopefully now we can at least move the needle on what is that third of that hesitant population regarding getting vaccinated. Um, we are super excited about that, having been, received full FDA approval. And that is for the 16 and older, the 12 to 15 uh, Pfizer vaccine is still under emergency use, but the 16 and older has received that full FDA approval. Um, and, you know, like, as I indicated, we're hopeful that this will create a potential for a decrease in vaccine hesitancy and increase in vaccinations for those who are waiting for that full authorization. Um, this is also, as you've probably all been seeing in the media, is likely to increase vaccine mandates um, from private business, certainly the military. I think that was just announced yesterday. Um, universities, not in the state of Arizona, given our governor's, uh, well, not just the governor, but given some of the laws that have passed, that that uh, opens up a lot of uh, different opportunities around vaccine related mandates for those businesses and such, considering that. And then of course, you're all aware because we sent out information, did a press release, and we are administering what are called the additional doses. And that is that third dose that the CDC has recommended for individuals who are moderately to severely immunocompromised and have received two doses of either Pfizer or uh, Moderna vaccine that they are eligible to receive a third dose. There is some specific criteria that the CDC has indicated identifying who is considered immunocompromised, how we are uh, operating and providing third doses here um, at our county clinic at King Street on Wednesdays. And then of course at our pop-ups is if folks come up, come up to the vaccine uh, clinic and want to get a third dose, we have a self-attestation, which is basically just a form that says what the CDC has recommended. It lists the immunocompromised and um, the, the, the specific categories of those who may be immunocompromised and are eligible. And the person can read that and then sign uh, that they would, would like to receive a third dose. We're not requiring proof of a doctor's note or anything like that. Uh, and we are um, providing that additional or third dose. 
Next slide, please. I do want to clarify, and we're working really hard, especially here in Coconino County, to make sure we're using the correct language around extra dose, third doses, and boosters, because many people, including in uh, at the state level and across the country, they're kind of using those terms interchangeably. And I want to be clear that they're not really interchangeable. That third dose for immunocompromised or third shot is, is different than when we start talking about boosters. Right now, the CDC is not recommending additional doses or booster shots for any other population at this, at this time. However, you've all heard in the news um, that our current administration is advocating for booster availability for individuals beginning September 20th who have previously received their second shot. So the idea behind this is truly a booster shot that people could begin receiving um, after September 20th. And of course, starting with those individuals uh, being eligible after eight months after receiving their second dose. So this typically, you know, we started administering vaccine back at the very end of December, first, basically the first week of January with our healthcare providers, um, some of our most vulnerable populations, and of course, um, law enforcement, first responders and others. And so the idea behind the booster is that those would be then available um, in the timing for which those that had got some of those first doses uh, of vaccination to, to coincide with that. Um, this is again, still subject to authorization by uh, the Food and Drug Administration and a recommendation by the CDC's ACIP uh, committee, which is that advisory committee on immunization practices. And they are, the FDA is still currently doing an independent evaluation about the safety and effectiveness of those booster doses. So we expect to hear more in the coming weeks. And certainly if they authorize that and ASIP recommends it, then as I was indicating, the goal is for the first people eligible to be those who were some of the first that received the vaccine, um, including healthcare providers, residents of long-term care facilities and other um, older adults. So we did get some information from the state uh, on Thursday that the federal uh, government plans to again partner with the federal pharmacy program for administration of those booster doses to our residents in our long-term care facilities. We are waiting to hear more information about that. That was a program that we relied uh, pretty heavily on in the beginning of vaccination distribution and certainly um, are going to be relying on our partner entities even more as we roll into boosters, because not only do we have boosters to uh, administer, we also have um, the duty to continue to provide those initial to get those who haven't been vaccinated yet. And then we are very close and nearing flu season, which we will be uh, obviously wanting to to be very proactive about getting flu shots and vaccinations out to our county residents. So that leads me um, it just kind of into a summary, letting you all know what those, what those implications mean uh, for HHS. We're gonna continue to administer COVID-19 vaccinations for individuals uh, use it, utilizing our clinic at HHS, as well as doing pop-ups. Um, we're, we're looking at a prioritization process regarding pop-ups around the county so that we can focus on our outlying areas and really looking to all of the other places to help direct people where they can get vaccines. Uh, anyone can walk into you know, a pharmacy right now in Coconino County uh, and get a COVID vaccine along with multiple other locations. So we're really gonna be relying heavily and talking with our partners to assist in this effort. With respect to the providing flu shots and vaccinations to county residents, that has always been a priority of HHS. What we intend to do is to combine it with many of our efforts as we are doing COVID-19 vaccinations that we would also offer flu vaccinations. We haven't received the flu vaccine yet, but we do anticipate starting to get that in um, within the next couple of weeks as we move into September. Um, so with that, we continue to plan and are working with our partners are looking at 
Um, the best way that we can manage um, how we roll this out with our uh, limited staffing, and we'll be bringing more information to you as we uh, put that together. Next slide, please. One of the things that the state is doing, and that is uh, going to be an excellent resource for us in terms of being able to continue to provide mobile vaccine operations throughout the county is the state has created a vaccine request form that anyone from a county level, companies and organizations can request vaccine events. And there's actually a link in your packet and we're gonna be putting out and doing some additional um, messaging around this to our communities and our business community uh, and, and to our external partners to know that this is available. What this is, is the ADHS, um, there's multiple partners who are contracted with ADHS to stand up mobile vaccination events. And these will be requested through this form. Uh, what, what ultimately it is, is it's an individual or the business goes in, says what they are looking for, when they would like an event, and then that they can agree to advertise their event, get the information out if it's an employer event and let the state know that they believe they can get at least 20 individuals at that event, then the state will partner with our contractors and coordinate it to stand up and fill those requests. What that will do is allow us to keep prioritizing our outlying areas and our most vulnerable communities. And um, certainly then that's going to keep us able to, to provide what we need to around the county, but also being mindful that we, while we have a mobile uh, vaccination team, it is small, uh, but it is mighty, then they are pretty amazing. And as you are all aware, getting around the county, and I'll be sharing with you some of the upcoming events that are already uh, in the works and or scheduled. Next slide, please. So these are the uh, recurring events that we have, of course, our Wednesdays at King Street, the, continuing at the community market on Wednesdays. Uh, there's a couple more Wednesdays left of those community markets. This has been a, a place where we, and our, certainly our King Street location as well, where we seem to get the biggest and best turnout, which is important um, in terms of, of assessing uh, our ability to be at multiple locations. Uh, the courthouse on Fridays, again, will continue probably for a few more Fridays and the rotating Friday, Saturday music and movies on the square. We are doing a pop-up, um, actually today we were doing, it's actually over now, uh, a pop-up at the Coconino Community College in partnership with them. The team was over there providing vaccinations. And then this afternoon, they are now on NAU South campus uh, providing a pop-up event to see how well that's received outside of the Du Bois area with all the students back. Uh, resuming classes to see how well that is received. And then on the 28th, we're gonna be back up in Fredonia uh, for another event. I do wanna indicate here before moving to the next slide, the vaccines that are currently being provided at the NAU Fieldhouse on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, this will be the last weekend that those, those will be the recurring dates. Originally, the plan was for uh, NAU to just transition to a campus health model of vaccinations. However, on a call this morning, we talked with PMG and NAU is uh, actively looking at uh, potentially continuing that, but at a different kind of footprint and has asked PMG to look at doing a different kinds of hours preferably on like a Saturday and Sunday afternoon time, which will not conflict with their expanded testing that they're doing in the field house. So I'll have more information on that. We're meeting again on Friday uh, to see where we go with that. So that is looking um, very likely to be extended to keep that vaccine present, especially as we know we're gonna be going into booster doses. Next slide, please. So now I want to talk a little bit about the school support. Um, you know that our K through 12 schools have just recently, um, pretty much all of them now are back in session. Um, there's been lots of different iterations of 
uh, which schools some are requiring masks right now, um, at least and through the end of September, depending on how things shake out in the legal world around that. One of the things that we did, and I know I mentioned this to the board in terms of looking at ways in which we can support the schools and also help the schools and parents understand what our public health authority is around isolation and quarantine. So what we did is we compiled a letter uh, that went to school leaders specifically, and then we drafted a parent and guardian letter that the schools could send out to their students and families if they so choose. And what we covered in those letters is the role of public health um, we talked about case investigations and that requirement around quarantine and isolation and, and our authority as a public health entity in doing so. And we also then created, and I'm going to show you a couple little clips from the letter that was a visual to understand um, the quarantine and isolation protocols that are in place. And as you all are aware, those have changed substantially over time with vaccinations, with other information and studies that are going on. So we, we put some clips in those letters so that people will have a way to refer uh, to that information, hopefully helping to clear up some confusion. And of course, we still remain available to take those questions, which we are from the schools. The schools still have a reporting requirement. They are to be reporting those cases of positive and other exposures to us. And, and so far we're off to a good start in terms of them certainly uh, and they have done a fantastic job even early on in reporting to us as needed so that we can begin our work and help support them in notifying those who may be contacts. So the next couple slides, if we can um, just quickly pop them up here. This is a clip from uh, some of the, from, from the letter that really just helps spell out the differences between quarantine and also um, vaccinated versus non-vaccinated individuals. Next slide, please. And then um, also when people can be released from quarantine. And then of course, being very clear about um, regardless of your vaccination status or prior infection, anyone who tests positive or who has symptoms uh, consistent uh, must be in isolation. And so that we have this information out there, not only for the schools, but also for the schools and parents. And I know that that, that information just went out um, early this week and we've already received some really positive feedback from the schools specifically thanking us for this effort. And I, in fact, have shared the letters that we sent with other health officers around the state who many of them asked if they could just take this verbatim and just change the information in the letter, obviously linking them to their county's resources. So hopefully this will be a good tool for us and the schools in, in how we are gonna manage um, as we just went back into to, uh, full in-person school to see how best we can mitigate the spread of the illness. So next, I just wanted to give an overview, you've all been hearing from me about, well, and certainly in uh, consent agendas and others been approving grants uh, related to COVID. And I wanted to just kind of take a minute to outline some of the things that are currently in place or we're just waiting on that will be going into place around supporting those who are positive, uh, test positive for COVID and, and or um, their students and or their families. One of the grants that we uh, wrote for was a K-12 wraparound services grant. It's a grant that covers a span of one year. We are waiting for that contract from ADHS. But what, that, what is included in that grant is a partnership with Health Choice to provide services to positive students and their families. And this is countywide uh, that Health Choice will be um, working to with the schools in, in partnership with the schools, getting that information. And then we will be passing through funds to them so that they can provide things such as hotel rooms uh, for those that may need to, uh, families that need to quarantine and isolate as well as other wraparound services 
uh, whether that's food, shelter, um, internet services, other kinds of things so that the, the kids and families can be supported while they are in the midst of this COVID uh, illness and exposure. Also included in that grant is funding that will go to the superintendent of schools. It's specifically for communication support to support the ADHS pooled testing grant and just to continue to uh, communicate and hopefully get all of our schools to implement some form of either pool testing or mitigation related type of testing in all K through 12 schools. Another grant that um, we have is a, that we have applied for and received is a vaccine equity grant. And this is for three years. This is a uh, contract that the, has come to the board as well. We are just waiting for uh, the return back from the partners uh, so that we can get this fully implemented. And this is a partnership to provide nursing and vaccine outreach staff to participating schools. And there were four schools that um, opted in to participate in this program. And now I just lost my slide that, or my note that shows what those schools are. So I'm gonna to try to remember off the top of my head, um, FUSD, Maine Consolidated, Fredonia, and there's one more, which I will find um, before the end and I'll let you know. So that those um, are in play now. And next slide. Oh, and the last one is Page. So Page is the fourth one. The last piece that I want to cover uh, is this COVID uh, health disparities grant. This also just came to the board either last, the, the previous board meeting, I believe. This is for a two year um, grant. The board has approved it. The contract's been signed on our end, and we're just waiting for the memorandums of understanding to come back from all of the partner entities who are going to be receiving this funding. And just to recap for all of you, this was a, a grant for a little over $4 million that we received, and which the majority of this money is actually going out to multiple partners across the county. And I just, now that we've had an opportunity to meet with all of them, um, let them know that we had obtained this grant money, I wanted to be able to share with you uh, just quickly what uh, this money is and how it's kind of divided out amongst partners and, ac and across the county. Uh, the guidance center is receiving just under $145,000 uh, specifically to utilize for outreach and identify participants to hire a resource navigator to connect individuals to services and refer them to community-based organizations. When we met with the guidance center uh, with Lauren Louder, she indicated and she was super excited because they have been trying to look for a way to place a resource navigator case manager with Blackstaff Shelter Services. So that is going to be happening as a result of this grant. Uh, the Salvation Army is going to be receiving $9,000 to provide gas vouchers to families so that they can attend their doctor, dental, or other healthcare appointments, including COVID testing and vaccines. Um, NAU Share is uh, going to be receiving $240,000 to conduct an epidemiological modeling be able to visualize and put into perspective the communities that have been most impacted by those disparities to establish a community advisory board and to conduct a community assessment, which will hopefully allow us to have access to even more future funding. Um, Mountain Line is going to receive $100,000 to provide bus passes to families and individuals for attending medical, dental, and health appointments. NACA will be receiving just under $245,000 also for outreach um, to identify participants, to hire a resource navigator, to connect to services and refer them to community-based organizations, to provide cell phone data cards to families, to access health education and community services. Blackstaff, excuse me, Blackstaff Shelter Services, $100,000 to conduct also outreach and identify participants uh, provide temporary sheltering um, in hotels and, and other locations to medically compromised individuals and families for COVID isolation and quarantine. Uh, Flagstaffresources.com 
uh, will be receiving $150,000 to develop a true online resource guide for all areas of Coconino County. And we will look to uh, come back to you in the future to show you uh, what this um, exciting piece is that we think will really help us bridge what right now is about four or five different uh, resource guides that are printed and distributed by various entities that as soon as they are printed or even before they're printed are typically outdated in some respect uh, because something has changed. And so having this as an online resource guide in able to be updated um, in real time, we see as something being really beneficial uh, as we continue to provide services throughout the county. And then the last few things, and as you can see, there's a lot of money here. So there's a lot of places it's going. So bear with me. Flagstaff Family Food Center is gonna be receiving $171,000 also to do outreach uh, resource navigation to connect to services, assist with food delivery, meals and basic necessities to individuals quarantined or affected by uh, disparities due to COVID. Catholic Charities will be receiving uh, just under $265,000 to also conduct outreach and identify participants to provide temporary sheltering and necessities to individuals and families. Association for Supportive Child Care, just under $145,000 to do outreach to hire a resource navigator to connect to services and refer them to community-based organizations. Red Feather, uh, just 341, just a little more than $341,000 also to employ a resource navigator to con connect to services and refer them to community-based organizations. Also to conduct home assessments focused on improving living conditions of on-reservation residents and minor repairs. This will also provide funding for 200 hand washing stations and 200 HEPA air filters. Encompass Health Services in Page, just under 145,000 to also conduct outreach, employ a resource navigator and refer to community organizations as needed. Uh, Chicanas por la Causa, $100,000 to provide prepaid cell phone and data cards to ensure individuals and families can connect with the internet for their health education and community services. And lastly, uh, partnering with all of the food banks that are currently in operation throughout the entire county. Um, each of these and will be receiving $30,000 each to help provide food to families, uh, packaging and refrigeration and transportation. So that includes Town of Fredonia, our own senior centers, uh, Golden Rule Charities, Talani Senior Center, Circle of Page, Ash Fork Church, Church of the Nations, Grand Canyon Food Pantry, St. Vincent de Paul, Blackstaff Family, and Flagstaff Family Food Center. So that was a lot. Um, now I'm gonna pause and uh, turn it back to the board, Chair Ryan, for questions and comments. There we go. Kind of flipped back on me. There we go. All right. Did you repeat that, Kim? <laughs> Which part? Yeah. The middle part, just the middle part. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, I, I, I was looking at our grant that we had today, and we're looking at more people, uh, you know, that you're, you're putting in for a grant. And, you know, one thing, uh, maybe somehow in the future, seeing who's doing what, you know, uh, don't need it now or anything like that, but uh, it, it'll start to get confusing. Which grant was that and, and what's happening with it? Uh, just a, a thought associated with it. I think we have a number of questions. We have, uh, it looks like Judy popped up. So I'm going to give Judy the opportunity uh, to go first here and then uh, we'll follow up with other board members. Go ahead, Judy. Oh, you're muted. You're doing a Matt Ryan there. You're muted. <laughs> I think we need to call it if I'm starting to act like Matt Ryan. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for a very detailed uh, presentation that you made. Um, excellent. And I really appreciate all the information that you provided to us. And certainly, you know, COVID and, um, and all this testing and the shots that are being done is very critical. And 
at this point because our numbers are climbing up a little bit at a time. And I'm glad that you're on top of everything, you know, to ensure that, you know, you, I'm pretty sure that there's some off of this information that you're pro providing us that we will be able to make some decisions for our constituents out there and, and as a whole in the county. So, um, but I just wanted to say um, at, uh, with this presentation, um, have you uh, put this information in any of the papers, like or any of the papers, newspapers, um, just a general, you know, information that you gave us as to how our numbers are rising by the date. I think that the the graphing is something that is very visible and people can understand that. And I think that they will be able to do that, um, uh, get it out to um, possibly um, the um, uh, local papers and you know. I think that will be very informative because I know that kids will share, grandkids will share that with their grandparents and stuff like that, or even through the school, um, um, have them take them home. I know a lot of times they take papers home too. So I think the more we, more people we um, get <clears throat> uh, information to, I think that will, you know, be able to be, and then continuing um, washing their hands and all the protocols that we have. I think, you know, at this point in time, we really need to, um, try to um, pursue that again, like it, like you did before. And um, so that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. Appreciate the presentation. Thank you, uh, Supervisor. And I, I will just let you know that we absolutely continue to um, actually do interviews with the local paper almost weekly. I mean, there was a few weeks where it had slowed off a little bit, but it has picked back up. Um, they are tracking and reporting our numbers in the paper. And we continue to put out every week I'm on our social media and such when we publish our uh, weekly report and that's available on our website. So we continue to look for every opportunity to be communicating that information out across the county so people can understand the, the situation that we're in and what, what they need to do to help us uh, get out of it. So thank you. Gosh, I'm trying to get to the mute button and uh, all kinds of things are popping up on my screen. Um, I'll tap into other board members. Uh, uh, Supervisor Horseman, go ahead, Tracy. Yes, and, and hi, Kim. Thank you very much. Well, that was some report and uh, incredible grant support opportunities all across um, uh, the region, quite frankly, and, and for so many different um, sources and for so many different needs. So. That was excellent information. Thank you for that. So I do have a couple of questions. Number, well, I'm gonna make a comment first. I certainly hope with the new FDA approval that we're gonna get this vaccination rate off its plateau. I mean, this is ridiculous that we have just been plateaued here for so long as we see our transmission rate going up and up and up here in this county. And as I said before, it does not need to be this way. We need to get shots in arms. So um, I'm glad about the FDA approval for Pfizer uh, and hopefully Moderna is not far behind. Uh, and I'm hopeful that uh, we'll see some approval from 12 to 16. I know that is a concern for a lot of um, the folks that I know and for their school aged children. So uh, a question I do have on um, the uh, boosters, number one, um, when uh, that uh, after September 20th. Um, and are, if somebody received Moderna, do they need to receive the booster of Moderna or does it matter? Would be number one. And number two, and related to that, is that uh, what kind of availability are we going to have? Because those 57% who are trying to get that vaccine early on, we probably will see that same 57% trying to get that uh, booster shot come September. 20th. So thank you, uh, Chair Ryan, Supervisor Horseman, uh, for that question. Um, I'll answer first your question about boosters and the same, do uh, same type of vaccine. The recommendation is that the boosters, at least everything we're seeing right now, the recommendation is that those will, the recommendation is that you do get the same type of vaccine 
the booster for what you received your first two doses for, unless it's not available. And we intend to have available at all of our, uh, well, all over Northern Arizona, we intend to have available uh, both Pfizer and Moderna. So that should not become an issue um, with respect to our county having that availability. So that is the recommendation, um, currently the recommendation through CDC. And I expect that we'll get more information as they get ready to do the actual approval and recommendations. The, the second question that you asked about how are we gonna be able to accommodate lots of people wanting to get their booster dose. And so what's different this time, uh, supervisor, that I will point out is that when we first started administering vaccine, we were one of only a few locations able to get vaccine. Now that Pfizer has um, some other, it can stay refrigerated up to um, 30 days once it's uh, defrosted from that cold storage. So lots of other providers now have vaccine in their hands. Uh, the pharmacies, there's not a vaccine shortage like there was when we first rolled out vaccines. So we're really hoping that we can utilize, and, and not just hoping, we're gonna need to utilize our partner entities to step up and to provide vaccinations for those folks with needing booster shots. That means family care providers, Certainly the pharmacies who have been doing a stellar job at that as well, having that availability, because again, people can go a lot more places now than when we first, when vaccine was scarce and we were um, doing it by prioritization. So we're really hopeful that we can give everyone all of those locations where you can go get a vaccine and that people will disperse accordingly. Like we're not going to be restricted by county. There's a lot of hopefully positive things that aren't going to lead to um, you know, while I expect there's going to be a lot of people rushing, which I can fully appreciate, there should be a lot of other places where they can get to um, those events. And then we're also, we're just continuing to plan for that as well. Supervisor, that's one of the things we're meeting actually about on, it's either tomorrow or Friday, I have to look at my calendar uh, to do some additional planning around that and how we can engage um, our partners around the county to help spread that out. And can you get the flu shot and the COVID booster at the same time? Yes, you can. And so yeah. that is one of the big things that we're gonna be doing as we get the flu vaccine. We're gonna have the flu vaccine available at all of our locations because we wanna make sure that people are getting that flu vaccine. We can't forget that flu you know, kills lots of people every year and especially young people. And so we've, we wanna make sure that we're um, messaging and providing both of those and have that availability. And again, flu vaccine is going to be available at all of the locations where people have typically received their flu vaccine in the past as well, but there is not an issue with receiving both your COVID shot, whether it's your first dose or your booster shot or your second dose, there's not an issue with uh, receiving a flu vaccine at the same time. Good, thank you very much. I appreciate mm -hmm. you and your staff and all the hard work you're doing here in the county. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Supervisor Vasquez. Sure. Hello, thank you for another great report. Not, uh, not encouraging news, but at least uh, very thorough. And it's good to know that the, the Health and Human Services is really working on it. Um, I did have a question about the, uh, the, the vaccine. I've come across a lot of folks that got their first vaccine and then missed the 30 days or 28 days for their second vaccine. If that happens, can they still get their second vaccine or do they have to start over and get the first one? Yeah, thank you, uh, Supervisor Vasquez for that question. Um, and we are not making people start over. They can absolutely come get their second dose of vaccine. Um, they just need to show up at one of the pop-up clinics to, to obtain that vaccine. There are different uh, places who are doing different things in terms of making folks start over. That is really not the recommendation from CDC um, that they start over. They can still get that second dose, which is going to impact and raise their antibody level against the vaccine. So please encourage them. If they didn't get it, tell them to show up and get it now. Okay, great, thank you. And then I did get a question while you were presenting uh, a text asking, for com different community organizations that are seeing the grants available out, how do they access some of the, those funds or how, who should I direct them towards to, uh, to get more information about those grant possibilities? 
So we are, so the grants, them, the, the grant itself, that is all the ones that I just went through, we have been reaching out to each of those organizations because we have to get an MOU signed from them. Then what we will do is get all of those partners together. And with that online resource uh, navigation tool that I was speaking about, the intent is to actually do really a big um, campaign, if you will, so that all of the entities and all of our social service and other safety net providers are aware of where those services are so that they can link and send their clients and connect their clients where they uh, can get that information. So in the meantime, supervisor, if you have anybody specifically, refer them directly to myself or to, uh, to uh, my deputy, Michelle Axland, and we can make sure that we reach out to those agencies and get them the information that they need. Great, thank you, I really appreciate it. Thank you for the report. Others? Uh, Kim, I'll ask you the question that I'm gonna ask you every time. Uh, any update on, uh, on uh, kids younger than uh, the 12? Yeah, so I just actually, um, Knowing you were going to ask me, not 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 just because I knew you were going to ask me, but actually there was just a recent um, article that came out about that that I was just reading this afternoon. Um, right now, it appears, un unfortunately, it's probably going to be closer to the end of the year, certainly for full approval. Um, it is hopeful that there will be approval of five and between that five and 11 age of Pfizer, hopefully sometime in October of the emergency use authorization. For those that are holding out for the full approval, it's likely going to be towards the end of the year um, for that full FDA approval. Um, it, and the reason being is they're still doing studies. And, and I think this is important because, and I think this is an important message to everyone. And, and that's why we can sit here and I can stand up here and say, vaccines are safe, effective, and do all of these things because there is research and medicine and science that goes into this process before they even put them up for emergency use. So what they're doing with that five to 11 age is they're really trying to figure out what dosage is best for that younger child age popula population. It basically, you know, the 12 to, to uh, 17 year old uh, Pfizer vaccine, they're getting the same doses as adults are getting. There's they're looking at that more closely for that five to 11 because they're so much smaller, um, obviously physically and otherwise. So they're wanting to make sure that it is going to be safe once they do put it out to emergency use. And then of course, for full approval. All right, thank you. Yeah, and I'm gonna always ask you that so, uh, until we get there, so. <laughs> That's no the big problem. one. I think uh, you know half of society is asking that question over and over. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, anything else from board? Uh, Kim, oh, oh looks at vice chair Fowler. Yeah. You're forgetting me today. <laughs> I yeah, I know I'm, I'm pretty loose on my asking instead of rolling through <laughs> the numbers here. You know. So, well, thank you, Kim, and thanks for your presentation and your continued work. And we thought we wouldn't be having these numbers game still. We thought we were like, okay, open up and let's go to a reopening phase. But looks like we're not there yet. Um, Navajo Nation had just put out a report um, in our county on Navajo Nation. There's an uncontrollable rise in um in cases in Bird Springs, Copper Mine, Inscription House, Kaibato, Luke, and Tonalia. And so, you know, when we talk about our communities, we gotta be thinking about all of our communities. And I know that you work very closely with our partnerships. And, um, and so just, uh, and then just the vast media campaign that is happening across the board from all fronts, but we're still um, thinking that we got a shot. Uh, I have my shot, so I don't have to wear my mask and, you know, I can gather and it's, yeah, we, we have to be very careful. And then we have our county fair coming up and we're gonna have to really do a campaign there to, um, 
you know, maybe test random people for their temperature or um, give out masks or, um, you know, give out some flyers and saying this is what's needed. And then we have the page balloon regatta that is going to be taking place, you know. So those are these these are big events that where we are in close proximity to people, which we want to do and we pray for that because we've been hanging out all by ourselves and we're sick of ourselves. We want to get out and do things, you know. Um, and so um, aside from going on beautiful hikes and all of that, but still, I think um, what you're doing is great. Um, and uh, there was a lot, there is a lot of question about the booster shot. Is it safe? Is it, you know, there's all these same questions keep coming up again. I think we need to do a lot more on that. Now, I was just wondering if maybe, you know, we've done town hall meetings and I wondered if maybe we need to um, do another one because it seems like we're now going into another phase. Now we're after you get your shot, after, you know, you still need to get your test done, you still need your vaccine shots. Now, you know, what is this third shot we're talking about? Then what is a booster shot? What is, what's the difference? You know, how do we know it's safe? Um, you know, and, and, but the social gathering, it's all open. So why are we very cautious about social gathering? You know, I mean, there's questions that are coming up. So I just wondered if maybe we want to do another, um, consider another um, town hall meeting, um, Mr. Chair and I guess county manager, just all of you just wondering if we really um, should do something like that so that we might be able to get the information out again. I know that, you know, after a while, once you keep seeing our release and, you know, like Navajo Nation, as you know, sends it out every day, the numbers every day is climbing. After a while, it's like, okay, I just, I just look at the numbers, you know, so, and, and we get numb to the information. So then we need to throw something else out to say, hey, caution, you know, here, here we are again. And maybe that might be another way of doing that. I know that, um, you know, we try to share some of the information but at the same time, you can over overdo it on a um, to, with people, and then we just can't. Um, we lose their attention. Yep. Thank you, Vice Chair. I, I think that it's a perfect time as we are, you know, obviously in ever changing uh, mode uh, with the boosters and everything else to look at all those different opportunities to get people to pay attention. Um, one of the things I meant to share, and I actually just got this today, and this kind of gets to how do we maybe switch up our messaging a little bit, what you were speaking about, Vice Chair. Um, one, our EPI team uh, put together um, a report, which we'll be sharing with you all, but with the top 10 causes of death um, in Coconino County in the last five years, and COVID-19 took over the top spot in 2020 mm -hmm. um, from cancer and heart disease, which um, is pretty impactful, if you ask me. I mean, we've all, most of us have all lost a loved one uh, to COVID, and certainly in Coconino County, we have suffered, in the Navajo Nation uh, and other tribal nations in particular, even more so, but it took over the top spot. And so one of the things that uh, Matt and some of the team members were posing is, you know, how do we kind of message this idea of, wouldn't you take a vaccine to prevent cancer? I mean, I know I would. Um, I think pretty much everyone would, right? Uh, and same thing about heart disease. Are you doing things now to mitigate heart disease because you know it is hereditary or those, are you on blood pressure medications? Are you doing other things? And so if COVID has taken our top spot and I'll just share with you, it, it was 18.4% of our total Deaths, cancer followed by 15% and heart disease by 12.5% and then accidents at 9.4 and then there's a few other things. Uh, but I just wanted to highlight that. I think we've got some opportunity to really look at um, how we help people understand the, the, the severity and the mortality associated with COVID even in comparison to some of the 
things that we know have been taking uh, the lives of our loved ones for many years. And, uh, and that's great information or just, you know, another approach is really good because, you know, even, even um, I hear people saying, I'm not looking at the national news anymore because it seems yeah. like it's the same, same all the time. Uh, and just a national debate as to whether to take it or not, or, you know, why should I, or even the healthcare workers. But I think just a more local message, which, which you, I know you've been trying to do. I think our public works department and our team have been doing really well. But uh, I, th I thought that maybe a, a town hall might be another way of um, providing this and working with our towns and cities to say, to help us to advertise that and just um, just to get the word out and really encourage people to um, really uh, watch out for themselves. And then we have, um, you know, our own ongoing um, um, events, uh, public events yeah. over at the uh, Fort Tut Hill. We have other events throughout the county. These are fall events and these are the last hurrah to be able to bring in the, the dollars before the, you know, the winter, the winter, um, you know, October 15th, really, that's when we like, okay, um, the Northern Arizona is closed now, um, kind of date. And so I think maybe before then we need to um, really consider that the Navajo Nation fairs are not going to happen because of this uh, COVID rise. And we canceled the Navajo, the Navajo uh, Bridge Star Party uh, and just to be on the caution side. So um, yeah, so anyway, that's, that's what I, I, I would bring up. Um, and then as far as the grants are concerned, um, I, I wish we had a lot um, really, you know, the, the, I hope all these organizations and I always say this, that they will be able to provide throughout the county. Um, I will say that I don't see um, St. Jude um, Food Bank on here. To the city, it is open and provides food and delivers all the way to Navajo Mountain. They're the deliverers that are in, in our region that covers all of the northernmost communities. But I'm really happy that this grant has come through I would really track to see and ask every one of these organizations um, to see where their service will be and how they're going to provide those services. Um, and because majority of them are not countywide services or organizations, they're Flagstaff based, which is good. You know, we need we need services and Flagstaff, but you know, as as rural counties. Um, we don't have nonprofits in our in our organization uh, or in our communities in certain regions, so it creates a challenge, and we have to depend on other look to other nonprofits that we hope will be able to reach out to us. However, majority of the time, those those nonprofits do not come out. So I and then I I wondered what the each of them um, are you have as a outreach. Um, resource navigator. What does that mean uh, for, I mean, that is a common, uh, it's like almost in every category, that's what it says. And I just wonder, what does that mean? So thank you for that question, Vice Chair Fowler. So first of all, I want to back up for a minute. We will make sure we can include St. Jude, because we, we, we were trying to capture all of them, they will get included. Um, so we will make sure that happens. But what a resource navigator is, is really a position um, that can be hired by these entities that is someone who lives and works in the community, speaks the language of the community, and is able to make those connections and ties to help people access the services. If they have hesitation because they don't know where to look, they may have issues with technology or not know how to access things may need rides, may need other resources. This is a connector uh, piece and position that will be hired by these in entities and should be people who live and work in their communities that can reach out to those who are most impacted and experiencing the health disparities related to uh, COVID-19. So that is what those positions are. And I will uh, commit to you that 
all of you that a, a couple of things. One is which we we are going to be hiring. So we, we've got all these grants. This is a very large grant along with other things. There's going to be a program manager who will solely be responsible for making sure that our partners are providing what they are being asked to provide and that it is being offered throughout the county and that we are networking and re reaching all of those um, areas of our county so that these resources can be accessed by all who live in our county. Um, to the very best of our ability, there is going to be some reporting requirements that we will need to be getting information from these entities. And so it is not just, and this is a reimbursement um, program. So we're not just handing over all the money and saying, Thing, run with it. We're telling they've got a lot of leeway, which is really important to private nonprofits. Having run one for a few years, not having extra restrictions is super helpful. But there, there are accountability. There is accountability to how those funds get used, and it will be on a reimbursement basis for whatever works best for those organizations. So hopefully that answers most of your questions, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, and um, I like to. And I'm, I'm happy that it's a reimbursement program and happy that we're gonna be tracking what their services are and where they are providing the services. So I think it'd be really good for us as uh, supervisors to be able to get reports in our district to, and, and to, for us to be able to um, get the word out in, in our uh, region to say, these are the services that are provided that are available and um, even uh, to be able to help these programs to be able to um, deliver those services. Uh, and I see that these uh, programs are from even out of state here. So I just like to just make sure that those programs are actually delivered the way we intend them to be delivered. So thank you. Absolutely, thank you. All right, I am going to move us on, but yeah, the communication piece is uh, a key piece now that we're getting the surge, uh, you know, uh, any way that we can help out, that, that would be key. And, and you know, putting us out in the forefront, uh, definitely. Um, by the way, I have to, I, you know, I'll, I'll say here publicly, uh, Patrice, your vaccinated thing, uh, bracelet, uh, great idea, great idea. Uh, but, you know, Kim, with uh, the opportunity with all these grants, you know, something that we, you know, maybe a pin, I don't know, uh, but uh, we need to reinforce uh, those that are doing what should be done out there. It, it would be, uh, I mean, I think all the expenditure that we went into tobacco awareness, I'm sure they're going to have an element of this in the COVID piece that we could use for uh, that uh, public information and outreach that we do uh, with this. So. Anyway. Chair Ryan, just, just a reminder for all of us, I know county does a great job on their websites of setting out where the pop-up vaccines are going to be, et cetera. You know, for those of us who do use social media, it's good to, you know, share it and get it out there. I think that's really yep. important. And if you aren't doing anything tomorrow at two o'clock, actually, epidemiologist Matt Maurer and myself will be doing a Facebook Live. And again, just trying to get as much information out in the community on a small sense as we can. And I do like the idea of sometime in the not too distant future of doing a, a, a real a town hall, live town hall would be great, so. Yeah, and I like how you said epidemiologist. Good job, you, you recovered too. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, it, it was, I was like, con, you know, conflating two words and it was like, oh my God, I give up. <laughs> yeah, it happened to me too. All right. Well, well I, now I, you're going to have to now you're going to have to learn a new term for the Pfizer vaccine now that it's been FDA approved. Um, it's got its new name and it's a uh, comirnaty. So when you see it, that's how it's pronounced, comirnaty. Um, it's a combination of comirnaty. And it's I'm going to practice that tonight for tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> um, and you have to spell it out phonetically. At least that's what I've been doing for the past couple of days because it, it tongue twists you as you try to decide where to put the emphasis on the syllable. Um, so, yeah, we, you know, because we, we have to keep everything switching up. And just for those listening and, and for the board's um, information, once FDA approval is granted, 
that is when vaccines and, and medications actually get their, um, their, their true name. Uh, obviously, Pfizer is the manufacturer. Uh, we've been referring to it as the Pfizer vaccine. Now that it's FDA approved for 16 and older, it is now called Comirnaty. So as you, if you hear that and start hearing and seeing it, uh, that's what it means. And, and each drug company will have a different name as well. Yes, and Pfizer, they're already, or Moderna, they're already putting out possible names. So yes, we'll, we'll have lots mm -hmm. more names to uh, be. To you can charge more if the name is more complex. Is that the idea? <laughs> I don't know. But they're yeah. still free for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, you, anyone yeah. can get a vaccine for free. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, That's I'm doing a... I'm doing a horrible job on time management, so I probably should move us along here. But a uh, uh, very good presentation, as always, and we'll, we'll all try and help feed it out there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ryan. Thank you, Board. So, Steve, uh, we have the ARPA uh, yeah, presentation. We've got a few slides to show. Um, I'll walk you through a couple of things that we're doing right now. But the, as I said before earlier today, the big, the big, um, the meeting will be on September 7th when we come to the board with uh, recommendations. So uh, our, our update for the week and uh, push slide please after this update. So county progress, we have been working and meeting with departments and looking at department requests. Also uh, looking at the, the, the proposal for ARPA budgeting. And so you'll recall during the budget process, we delayed and we've still delayed some of those budget increments or service improvement requests, pending the outcome of better knowledge and awareness of the guidelines and the interim rules related to ARPA. And so now that we, of course, um, it is still being worked on. So we've been we've receiving interim rules, uh, but of course that'll be rolling up into a final rule that Treasury will, will be releasing soon. Uh, we'll be coming to the board on September 7th. I've asked the clerk's office for extended time uh, on that agenda uh, in order to uh, provide a background information, of course, the recommendation itself. But prior to that time, staff will be uh, putting uh, some meetings on your calendar so we can do more individual briefings on the uh, ARPA recommendations, uh, some of the programs. And, and again, our focus for the last few months has been to look at the uh, in, the organizational needs uh, and, and the opportunities to invest our funds uh, within the organization to serve the public. Uh, and so uh, the recommendations will, you'll be seeing on this next slide, um, all departments uh, uh, with submitted requests have been interviewed. Uh, those interviews uh, have taken, been taking place the last few weeks. Uh, we finished our interviews, uh, in fact, last Friday. We had several interviews with departments and then uh, on August 20th, uh, and as of August 20th, and we've have submitted, they've submitted any changes to the request. And so the interviews with the departments has been, have been clarifying uh, some of the work that they were doing, some of the existing programs uh, that we've been looking at, and of course, new programs as well. And you'll see the bullet points under this, under this larger bullet. Uh, so we did survey uh, the departments. Uh, we looked at, looked at service improvement requests from the budget process. Uh, we have ARPA project proposals and department discussions. And also one other piece I wanna note related to the criminal justice uh, group uh, within the county. Um, I did engage um, retired uh, court administrator, court administrator Gerker Smart, and also our, our former presiding judge, Jeff Coker, uh, to uh, interview each of the criminal justice uh, stakeholders and agencies within the county structure uh, to determine the resources that would be needed uh, as we look at the, uh, the case flow uh, um, situation in, in Superior Court. And so they've had conversations with the county attorney, the courts, uh, justice courts, clerk of the court, uh, as I said, county attorney, public and legal defender. Uh, and so that'll be rolled up into a recommendation as a subset of the, of the recommendations that you'll be receiving on August, on September 7th. Next, next slide. <coughs> so again, the uh, progress in the budget area proposal for ARPA budgeting, uh, you know, we do of course have uh, direct funding. We did receive the first tranche, if you will, from treasury. Uh, then we have lost revenue utilization. So 
Uh, there's a calculation that, that finance and Siri and, and the budget team have gone through to identify uh, an amount uh, that represents loss revenue that, that occurred to the organization as a result of COVID impacts. And then when we look at the fiscal year 22 budget allocation, uh, we'll be looking at, of course, uh, some of the continuations from fiscal year 21. Uh, again, going back to the budget discussion that we left uh, prior to earlier this year at the, at, the, at the close of the budget process back in, in May and June. Uh, looking at those budget discussions and the processes and those service improvement requests and recommendations. And then, of course, the general fund uh, forecast will be updated uh, with this new information. And so I just want to remind folks, though, that, again, the funding that has been received, uh, it does need to be completely uh, spent down or spent out uh, by December of 2026. Uh, and so that's an important, you know, deadline by which uh, the funding is available. Uh, we do by December of 2024, need to have the, the funds identified in terms of the, the, where it's gonna be directed. And so those are the two, the two dates that are important to us. Next slide. So the recommendations review will include, of course, proposal for lost revenue utilization. And those funds have a, have a little more broadly, can be used a little more broadly um, you know, when we look at all of the, um, the, the guidelines from Treasury, of course, uh, those, are, those are focused in on, on uh, impacts that occurred as a result of COVID. Uh, but with the lost revenue utilization, those funds can be used a little more broadly. A lost revenue is a portion of the, of the $27 million that the county uh, has been allocated. So it's, it's not an addition to when we look at that, it's just an amount within that 27 million that they, they can be categorized as lost revenue. Looking at uh, the overview of recommended county projects, proposals, requests for direct ARPA funding. And again, we'll be looking at internal and collaborative projects. And then from their discussion of projects and proposals, requests recommended for alternate funding mechanism. And so this may be a mix of ARPA funding uh, and general fund funding, again, looking at, at the revenue and funding mechanisms needed for that. And then the next slide, the, time, the, fall, the fall process and timeline. As I said, the September 7th will be coming to the board uh, with the first phase of the recommendations uh, that will be presented to you by, by uh, our office and the ARPA team. Uh, the county manager and the team will present an overview of requests and recommended recommendations for our funding. And then again, we'll provide a proposal for funding additional projects through the fiscal year 22 budget allocations, which of course is our budget process that we, uh, we, we, we of course adopted the budget, but did not come to closure with regard to some of the service improvement requests. And those are gonna be talked about to get your uh, action on. September, we'll finalize funding allocations for internal county projects and begin the collaborative and external funding review process. And so an example of external funding review process, uh, you know, receiving requests from outside organizations and jurisdictions that have not received DARPA funding uh, to determine if the work that they've been doing uh, during COVID is, is, uh, is um, permittable uh, with regard to possible uh, county ARP funding. And so that's just an example of those external um, uh, discussions we'll be having, uh, of course, with you and your districts as well. So we can identify um, um, needs within your specific districts that may not be provided by the county per se, but are provided possibly by other organizations within your district that could be uh, 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 deemed eligible for ARP funding. And so again, uh, doing the internal, as well as then proceeding to do the external uh, review uh, scan of as well. Okay, from there, next slide. So Mr. Chair, again, uh, questions at this point in time, but again, the first phase will be coming to you on a September 7th for your action with recommendations prior to that 7th, we'll be sitting down with each of you and discussing uh, some of the staff work as well as beginning to get some of your input with regard to some of the district specific uh, opportunities that you may be uh, wanting to put on our radar as we do uh, as we go from the internal review to the external. So happy to answer any questions or comments uh, that you the board may have. Okay, let's go to the board. Do we have any uh, questions or comments at this point? 
Steve, uh, you know, we didn't have that one in our packet. You may have emailed it. Uh, I didn't uh, we'll send that out. The slide set. We'll okay. Send. Good. Good. Okay. And similar to uh, the Kim's stuff, I'm sure she's going to yep. post it. Over. We'll just we'll make sure that uh, we get that to the clerk's office for distribution. Okay. Fantastic. So I'm not seeing questions from board members. Uh, at this point, what we've done is we've worked our way through um, our agenda, uh, with the exception of uh, an, ex uh, an executive uh, session. And so um, uh, with that, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting um, catching up with this. So. Uh, uh, with that, knowing that we're going into executive session with an item that we're not coming back uh, with material on, um, uh, this meeting uh, will be adjourned upon the end of the executive session. Uh, and so uh, uh, with that said, uh, I need a motion. Uh, well, actually, uh, let's see. Is it your recommendation that we go into executive session? Uh, yes, Chair Ryan, it is. Okay, and so I need a motion to do so. I move that we go into executive session as second. recommended by our county attorney. Uh, I have a motion by vice chair, a second by uh, supervisor Horseman. All in favor of the motion, vote aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Okay, so we need to, for the sake of the public, we will not be coming back out. Um, we need to uh, leave this uh, Zoom meeting and go into uh, for the sake of the board and go into the team's meetings uh, for executive session. 